It's late at night, and you're driving down a desolate stretch of highway somewhere in New Mexico. There's nothing out here except for you, your car, and the road. What you don't know is that you're about to encounter something. Something terrifying. There's no moon, and the sky is pitch black. Your own car is barely lighting up the dark road ahead of you. Just then, you spot something in your rearview mirror. It's a pair of headlights. There's nothing too strange about them, except that they are especially bright. Your eyes are so adjusted to the darkness that you have to look away. When you glance in the mirror again, you see that they're closer. Much closer. They must be going awfully fast. You don't know why, but something about the car behind you makes you feel uneasy. There's something off. You speed up a little. Maybe you can keep some distance from them. But the lights keep getting closer. So you speed up a little more. Still, they gain on you, growing bigger and bigger in your rearview mirror. You're getting nervous. They look like they are barreling right towards you. You floor it. The lights are able to keep up easily, though. And now, they're right on your tail. No matter how fast you go, they stay right behind you. The lights are so bright and close that they're almost blinding. You're in a full-blown panic. What is going on? Now the lights are swerving back and forth behind you. What do they want? You take a sharp turn without indicating, but they follow you without difficulty. You keep your foot smashed down on the accelerator. Your engine is screaming, but they just get closer and closer. They're right on your bumper. The bright white lights burn your eyes so bad that you swat at the rearview mirror to point it down. You look up just in time to see the deer standing in the middle of the road. You slam on your brakes as hard as you can. Your tires squeal loudly in the night, and you brace yourself to both hit the deer and get rear-ended from behind. You stop inches from the deer as something incredible happens. The two headlights seem to split, passing by you on either side of your car. You and the deer lock eyes for a split second as if you're both thinking, what was that? Before the deer hops away into the night. You don't know what's happening, but you're not going to wait around to find out. You throw the car in reverse and hit the gas before whipping it around 180 degrees. You can't remember how far the last town was, but there's no chance you're going in the direction of those lights. You drive as fast as you can, checking your mirror constantly to see if anything is behind you. Nothing. Just darkness. Maybe you're finally safe. No, they're right in front of you. The lights somehow appear out of nowhere right in front of your car. You turn the wheel hard to avoid a head-on collision and you go flying off the road, smashing your head against the window as the car goes flipping and rolling and tumbling. The car comes to a stop a hundred feet off the road, upside down, with a lone blinking turn signal dimly lighting up the surrounding field. A single headlight approaches the car, but it's not moving like a vehicle, it's moving like an animal. You're concussed from the accident and your vision is starting to fade. The last thing you see a second light approaching. The next morning, the local sheriff is investigating the scene of a single car accident. Curiously, there's no body, just a few scraps of clothing and a pair of tennis shoes sitting neatly in the upside-down roof of the car. Strangest, though, are the childlike handprints all over the dirty car door. The sheriff doesn't know what to think. What the sheriff doesn't know is that he has just come upon the aftermath of an SCP-745 attack a strange and mysterious creature known as the Headlights. SCP-745 is the classification the SCP Foundation has given to a bipedal, nocturnal predator whose hunting grounds are an abandoned stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745's most distinctive feature, by far, is its head, the top of which is a bloated sack of translucent skin. There are no visible sensory organs present on the head, nor does it appear to have a solid skull and the creature's brain can be directly seen through the semi-transparent skin, which is covered in a web of bioluminescent organs. These organs are capable of producing a steady output of light that's been measured between 1400 to 3200 lumens, which is the equivalent of bright xenon gas headlights. The entity has been observed to have the ability to change the color of this light, as well as flash it in specific patterns. It is theorized that it engages in this behavior as a way to defend itself, and potentially may also use it as a way to communicate with other members of its species. The rest of SCP-745's body is covered in skin that is a deep, dark, black color that almost seems to absorb light. This quality, when paired with their blindingly bright head protrusion, 
gives the appearance of a floating point of light in the darkness. Because SCP-745 entities hunt almost exclusively in pairs, with their preferred hunting grounds being remote sections of highway, they are easily mistaken for oncoming or approaching headlights. Two SCP-745 entities are able to move together in perfect synchronicity, running in tandem at speeds up to 180 kilometers per hour. Together, they will target lone vehicles that they spot on the highway and will begin to chase or run straight towards them, giving the unlucky driver the impression that a fast-moving car is rapidly approaching them. After they near the targeted car, they will attempt to stop it by any means necessary, whether by simply forcing the driver to pull over out of fear or by running them off the road completely. Once their prey has stopped, crashed, or become otherwise incapacitated, the pair will stop moving together and approach the car separately to directly assault and then consume the vehicle's occupants. Next to no remains are left following an attack, save for a few scraps of clothing in the victim's shoes. Other than the damage sustained during the accident, there is never any other sign of struggle or forced entry, with the only other evidence left at the scene being the childlike handprints from SCP-745's small front paws. Strangely, analysis of SCP-745's genetic structure has revealed that unlike humans, they are not a carbon-based life form, meaning it is unlikely then that they are able to derive any nutrition from the consuming of human flesh. It is theorized then that they may be hunting solely for sport or some other form of perverse enjoyment. This question remains unanswered as currently there are no recorded observations of SCP-745 feeding in the wild, as successful attacks have never left any witnesses, and specimens captured by the SCP Foundation refuse to eat at all. No lairs, nests, or other refuge of SCP-745 has ever been found, nor has the Foundation located any breeding grounds or young examples of the entity. It's unknown how or if they reproduce, or when they may have first appeared. What is known is that they had established a wide hunting territory across the American Southwest until Foundation teams began a program to thin their numbers in the 1960s. The effort appears to have been successful so far, and all recent sightings of SCP-745 have been limited to a specific stretch of highway in northern New Mexico. SCP-745 has been classified as Euclid, and in order to limit potential exposure to civilians, the Foundation has purchased the land surrounding the highway with traffic being redirected to other roads. Foundation security teams disguised as highway patrol officers are to remove any trespassers or lost travelers who accidentally find themselves on the dangerous stretch of highway. The security teams are also tasked with attempting to capture any instances of SCP-745 that they can, and any recovered creatures, live or dead, are to be loaded into Class 3 BCU storage containers and transferred to Site-17 for further study. Containment procedures that are able to preserve living specimens are still being researched, and currently, no examples of SCP-745 have survived for more than a week in captivity. However, seeing as there have been no new sightings of SCP-745 outside of the isolated and monitored stretch of highway, and all reports of phantom lights elsewhere in the country have not pointed to evidence of additional SCP-745 outbreaks, they are considered to be effectively contained. Two massive creatures are locked in a fight to the death in the middle of the sea. Destroyers, cruisers, and battleships fire special weapons and harpoons at one of the creatures, attempting to help turn the tide in favor of one. But they appear to have almost no effect on the gigantic monster. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-3700, also known as the Tides of War. SCP-3700 is what the SCP Foundation has labeled an 800-kilometer circular area in the North Sea. Located southeast of Iceland and north of the United Kingdom, the circle contains the Faroe, Orkney, and Shetland Islands. The seafloor is abnormally deep in this area, at roughly 5 kilometers below the ocean surface, roughly 20 times deeper than the rest of the North Sea. SCP-3700 experiences all kinds of strange, anomalous activity, including extreme weather and geological events. These are caused by the interaction between two separate entities, which have been designated as SCP-3700-1 and SCP-3700-2. SCP-3700-1 is an arthropod resembling the common lobster, except this crustacean is 6 kilometers long. 
It has a variety of blue, yellow, pink, and red markings carved into its carapace that resembles a woman's face. It has six arm-like limbs, four of which have claws, with two having club-like appendages on the end, and eight legs. It also has four orange eyes at the end of stalks. 3701's carapace shows significant damage, with many scars, cracks, and even some holes that reveal its soft inner tissue. It has several anomalous capabilities that it uses in its battle against SCP-3702. Its two club-like appendages are capable of striking, but they also produce a cavitation bubble that generates a force equal to several tons of dynamite, similar to what the mantis shrimp is able to do but on a much larger scale. Two of its eyes are able to project concentrated blasts of gamma radiation, and it's able to stop storms or other weather phenomena. Despite being 6 kilometers long, 3701 can reach speeds faster than 100 kilometers per hour, and has even shown the ability to demanifest and disappear if it doesn't locate SCP-3702 within roughly 15 days after appearing. SCP-3701 appears to be friendly in nature and shows some small signs of intelligence. When accompanied by Foundation ships, it will either ignore them or provide a small amount of aid by helping to move disabled craft away from danger. After appearing, it travels the full 800-kilometer area of SCP-3700 in a spiral pattern from the center out toward the edge. Interestingly, the center is the exact center point between the three island chains located within the circle, and is home to numerous shipwrecks. Since being first discovered by the Foundation in 1922, 3701 has slowed down considerably in its movement and has lost a significant amount of mass. It was first measured at a length of 16 kilometers, a full 10 kilometers longer than its current state. It also appears weaker and seems to be having a much harder time subduing SCP-3702. SCP-3702, on the other hand, looks like it belongs to the family of ray-finned fish and has an appearance that closely resembles the pelican eel, except that it has 13 appendages encircling the middle section of its body. These appendages look like the tentacles of an octopus, complete with suckers, and can tuck them into its body when not in use. 3702 is currently 32 kilometers long, and opposite to SCP-3701, it is growing larger, having only been 300 meters long when first identified in 1945. Most of that length is the creature's whip-like tail that ends in a sharpened point. It's currently roughly one kilometer wide at its largest point, and each of its 13 tentacles is around 60 meters long. Its most distinctive feature is its massive mouth, which can open up almost 3 kilometers wide. 3702 is black in color, with white, purple, and red bioluminescent lines that resemble a man's face on either side of its torso. SCP-3702 can create sudden changes in the weather, generating huge storms and Category 5 hurricanes, as well as massive whirlpools that suck in any vessel within 150 meters before grabbing them with its tentacles and tearing them apart. It's also able to produce high-energy sound waves and streams of blue fire from its mouth that it uses to destroy close-range targets. SCP-3702 appears at random locations within the 800-kilometer area, except during the spring and autumn equinoxes, when it appears at the exact center of SCP-3700. It stays submerged unless it encounters 3701 or another object and will demanifest roughly 15 days after first appearing. It's extremely hostile to any creature or object that approaches it, and has even been witnessed destroying entire pods of whales. Conventional weapons have no effect on it, and even special anomalous weapons used by the Foundation have only had a moderate effect. Only 3701 has so far been able to subdue it. When SCP-3701 and 3702 do meet each other, they will engage in a prolonged fight, with each attempting to temporarily kill or subdue the other. Historically, the winner of each contest would swap depending on which half of the year it was, with 3701 consistently winning during the Northern Hemisphere's spring and summer, and 3702 winning during the fall and winter. However, since the Foundation has begun implementing containment procedures, 
SCP-3701 has won the last 64 cycles in a row. A number of changes happen when one of the creatures wins. When 3701 is successful, major storms in the area immediately cease, crop yields double, and local oceanic life increases their reproductive rates by a factor of three. This can lead to dead zones forming from the overpopulation of certain species of zooplankton. Erosion rates on the islands also increase by a factor of five, which has led to the Foundation needing to bring in large amounts of dirt and sand in an attempt to combat it. When SCP-3702 wins and subdues or kills 3701, the weather becomes very dangerous with powerful hurricanes and rapid temperature changes that can range from below zero to over 28 degrees Celsius, capable of causing massive damage to buildings and huge losses of life. Travel by sea becomes extremely difficult due to huge waves and storm surges, making it difficult for supplies to reach the islands. Ocean food sources are driven from the area and crop yields are reduced. Following its victory, 3702 does not demanifest and instead continues to patrol the area and attack vessels and will even approach the islands themselves. Foundation Naval Task Force Delta-7, nicknamed Northern Storm, is tasked with locating and assisting SCP-3701 in its struggle against 3702. Purchased from the United States military, it consists of 13 destroyers, 5 cruisers, and 15 smaller support craft. When Delta-7 locates SCP-3701, it will often acknowledge their presence by raising two of its claws into the air and clicking them while making a low, rumbling noise with its mouth. Delta-7 then accompanies SCP-3701 as it patrols its 800-kilometer area for 3702. Once the two meet, Delta-7 engages in Protocol Winter Maelstrom, where the destroyers shoot harpoon-based anchors into 3702's head before moving in a circular pattern while they and battleships fire on it to ensure it can't orient itself. The cruisers, meanwhile, attempt to draw its attention by firing and moving in a serpentine pattern at a distance of 300 meters. The two creatures will battle, blasting each other with gamma radiation and powerful sound waves. They whip, bite, and club each other, cracking armor and ripping off tentacles and other appendages, until one finally stops moving and dissolves into the sea. Should SCP-3702 be successful in defeating 3701, then Project Tumult is activated, and the following procedures must take place. First, there is an immediate evacuation of all naval and civilian craft from the 800-kilometer zone. Next, all trade and ferry routes are stopped or rerouted for at least six months, and land-based aquatic defenses are activated. Aerial craft will continue to monitor and engage with 3702, while others continue to look for a reappearance of SCP-3701. Since it appears that SCP-3701 continues to physically degrade, and with the exact opposite being true for 3702, it's been proposed to let 3702 win and subdue 3701 twice every five years, despite the terrible effect on locals in the area. Though this plan has yet to be approved, it may be the only chance to stop 3702 from becoming so strong that 3701 is never able to defeat it again. The guerrilla soldiers fire their rifles blindly into the jungle. They don't know what exactly they're shooting at, but something is out there among the trees, something they can't see, something that's killing them. One of the young soldiers, barely more than a boy, stops to reload. As he pulls the magazine from his rifle, a blur passes by. The soldier next to him suddenly drops to his knees, clutching his neck, blood pouring out between his fingers. A hand grasps the boy's shoulder, and he spins around, nearly opening fire on his commander. The older man tells him they've got to go, and the boy joins a small group of soldiers who start running through the jungle, trying to get away from whatever this thing is. As they run, there's another flash of movement, and one of the soldiers is pulled into the trees. He can hear his screams mixed with the otherworldly shrieks, but there's nothing they can do. It's already too late for him. Another soldier disappears into the trees with a blur. It's just him and the commander now. They emerge from the jungle into a clearing that contains a small abandoned farm. The commander motions for them to head towards the old farmhouse, and the two take cover around the corner of the home. They crouch with their guns ready, peeking around the corner, looking for any sign of the monster that's killed so many of their comrades. The boy wants to know what they should do. He opens his mouth to ask the commander, 
but he puts a finger to his lips and motions for the boy to keep watching. The boy peeks around the corner of the house, but he doesn't see anything emerging from the tree line. It's quiet, until the commander begins to scream. The boy turns to see a point forming on his chest. It's a black circle. No, not black, something darker. It's like it is the absence of any and all light. The commander screams louder as the point of darkness grows. The commander's screams fade out, even as it looks like he continues to yell. The boy watches as the commander seems to be collapsing in, sucked into the dark orb in his chest. The commander's body folds in on itself, growing smaller and smaller, until it disappears completely into the black hole, which vanishes along with him. The boy doesn't know what he just saw, but he doesn't have time to think, because emerging from the forest is the creature. The boy has never seen anything like it and runs into the farmhouse. He locks the door and pushes the old kitchen table in front of it, trying to barricade it as best he can. He looks around and spots a bed against the wall. It's the best hiding spot he can find, so he runs and slides under the bed, pulling himself as close to the wall as he can. The boy watches and waits, unsure of what he should do. It's quiet. There's no more screaming of soldiers being killed or any more of those guttural animal-like squeals. Maybe it decided to go back to wherever it came from. The boy doesn't dare come out from under the bed, though. As he watches the door, waiting for something to burst through, he sees something else. Another of those black points appears in the middle of the room. It looks like it bends the light around it, distorting the room nearby. The boy watches from under the bed as out of the point, a thin black limb emerges. First one, then another. He can see its strange pointed legs with no feet standing just in front of the bed now. With a high-pitched cry, the creature effortlessly tosses the bed aside. The boy is left exposed, cowering against the wall. The creature screams, opening its wide mouth that seems to split its eyeless face in two, revealing two rows of jagged teeth. The boy screams back, crying in fear, and sees that the creature isn't eyeless after all. Inside its grotesque mouth, a milky blue ball appears. There's no iris, but the boy knows whatever this thing is. It's looking at him. The boy feels his chest grow tight. He looks down to see that one of the black points is forming on his chest. He can feel himself being squeezed and crushed, pulled down into this singular point. All noises, including his screams, disappear as he is pulled into this soundless void. But then he hears something again. He looks up to see that the creature is being riddled with bullets. It turns to escape and bursts through the wall of the farmhouse. The dark orb on the boy vanishes, and he sees, standing in the doorway, his friend and savior. He clutches his bleeding throat with one hand, holding his rifle in the other. The boy rushes to him as he collapses to the floor. Blood is pouring out of his neck, and he can no longer speak. But he dies knowing he saved his young friend. The boy starts to feel very tired, and he sits down next to his dead hero. He's all alone now, his entire group of freedom fighters now wiped out by this demon. The boy feels nauseous and dizzy. He coughs into his hand and looks down to see that it's covered in his own blood. A group of boys run down a jungle path, laughing and playing, when they suddenly stop and grow quiet. There's something up ahead of them. It's a man lying on the side of the road. The boys look scared, unsure if they should check it out. But then the smallest of all of them emerges from the group and bravely marches up to the man. Not wanting to let the youngest of their friends make them look like cowards, the rest of the boys soon follow. The man on the side of the road is moaning and looks to be in pain. As they get closer, they can see that he must have been in a terrible accident. His skin is gray, and it looks like his long, thin arms only have three fingers. What should they do? The small boy picks up a stick and reaches out with it to poke the man, not wanting to touch him with his own hands. But before he can, the man rolls over, opening his mouth with a horrible shriek to reveal the glassy blue eye inside as the boys turn and run, hands over their ears. Several weeks later, the small Guatemalan town holds a meeting. A crowd of people in the room are angrily yelling at the mayor who stands at a podium, demanding answers from him about what happened to their dead or missing loved ones. A series of photos are hung on the wall behind the mayor in remembrance of those who have disappeared into the forest or mysteriously died from a rapid illness including the brave young boy. One man shouts at the mayor, wanting to know where his daughter was. Another asks how her healthy husband could drop dead from an illness after being perfectly healthy only days before. The mayor tries to calm the frustrated townspeople, telling them that he knows there have been rumors of a demon out in the forest, but that's all they are, rumors. 
The mayor warns them, though, that something is out there, though he doesn't know what. There is an animal or man that is making people sick. It may also be hunting people. Neither he nor the police know exactly what is going on. But there is good news. A group of men have come to help them. The mayor points towards a stern-looking man in a military uniform who is standing with a small group of other soldiers and a scientist off to the side of the stage. The mayor explains that this man, General Machoy, is from America, and that he's going to help them. The crowd doesn't cheer in the way that the mayor seems to have expected, but they at least stop their yelling as the general steps to the podium and thanks the mayor for the introduction. The general looks over the crowd who are waiting and hungry for answers about the monster that's suddenly begun plaguing their town. He tells them that it is true that he's been sent here by the U.S. government in order to investigate what's been happening and stop whatever threat is out there in the jungle by any means necessary. He can't promise that he'll be able to bring back any of their missing loved ones, but he can at least prevent whatever this is from taking any more. He then gestures to the rest of his group and tells the crowd that the men he has brought with him have been specially trained to deal with this exact type of situation and that they don't need to worry any longer. The only thing everyone needs to do is stay out of their way and all will be taken care of. With that, he walks off the stage as the crowd erupts into more shouting. General Machoy stops at the scientists waiting next to the stage. Well, Dr. Ketter, what do you think? The scientist adjusts his glasses and answers, This is what we've been preparing for. The overseers kept telling us this day would come. It looks like it finally has. The group of soldiers led by General Machoy make their way through the dense forest. Dr. Ketter is just ahead of them, using a Geiger counter to follow the creature, the audible clicks of the radioactive entity telling him which way it came. They track the source of the radiation to a clearing in the jungle where a small village once stood. Most of the buildings are overgrown with plants and thick vines, but with it growing dark, this seems as safe a place as they will find to make their camp for the night. The soldiers fan out to search what's left of the town as Dr. Ketter continues looking around for where the radioactive trail might lead them next. As General Machoy is checking out one of the many dark old buildings, one of the older soldiers cries out, Hey General, it looks like this generator still works. With the sound of an old diesel motor coming to life, lights in the village suddenly flicker on. They now have fortifications and light. Though he'd never admit it, General Machoy was feeling nervous about spending the night in the jungle. But now at least some of those nerves were being washed away by the old flickering yellow lights. Later that night, the general is questioning Dr. Ketter on where the creature went. Dr. Ketter is confused, though. His readings showed high traces of radiation leading into this village. The creature came here, he was sure of it, but now he can't figure out where it went. It's as if it came into the village and then simply vanished. Outside, one of the soldiers on watch tells the rest of the group who are sitting around a fire to shut up, that he thinks he saw something in the woods. Everyone immediately springs into action, taking defensive positions and aiming their rifles into the dark tree line. There it is again, he says, as a flash of darkness moves just beyond the clearing. No, it's over here, says another soldier on the opposite side. How could the creature be moving so fast around them? Are there multiple of whatever this is out there? The soldiers form a circle to make sure that the thing can't get behind them. What they can't see is the point of darkness forming behind all of their backs and the thin pointed legs stepping out of it. The general's radio comes to life. I think we've got something out here, Gen- But his message is cut off by screams and the sound of gunfire. General Machoy tells Dr. Ketter to stay inside and runs out of the building, where he finally gets a glimpse of the demon that they've been tracking. The tall, thin creature is massacring his squad. It dashes between them at an inhuman speed, using its three-fingered hands to rip the limbs off of some soldiers and slash at others with its razor-sharp claws, opening up their necks or disemboweling them before moving on to the next. The general fires his rifle at the creature and misses, but it's enough to get it to retreat. General Machoy runs back inside the building where Dr. Ketter is waiting. What was it? What did you see out there? The general doesn't know how to begin describing the monster that just killed all of his men. It's like nothing he's ever seen before, and something that no amount of training could prepare him for. As the two men ponder what to do next, the Geiger counter on the table suddenly starts to click, softly at first, but then more and more, as if a huge amount of radiation has suddenly flooded the room. The general grabs the doctor and drags him out, leaping out of the building just before it collapses in on itself, disappearing into the micro-singularity that formed inside. The two men look up to see it standing right in front of them, its huge mouth open to reveal its glassy blue eye. Look out, Dr. Ketter cries, but he isn't talking about the demon as he and the general roll to the side, just avoiding the power line that has been cut loose by the destroyed building. 
The power line hits the ground and immediately begins to spark, sending out bright pulses of white electrical light. The creature cries out with a gut-wrenching scream and collapses to the ground, huddling up into a ball as it tries to cover up its mouth with its thin arms. Is it the electricity? The general asks, confused about what suddenly stopped the killer's rampage. But Dr. Ketter realizes it isn't the sparking power line that the creature has been immobilized by, it's the flashing lights. The general doesn't wait for his answer, though, and fires the weighted net from his gun, trapping the howling creature. Dr. Ketter examines the creature at the field research center that has been set up several miles from the village. A strobe light has been affixed to the inside of the creature's cage, but even when the doctor turns the light off, the grayish-brown-skinned entity still remains curled up in a ball on the floor. The doctor wonders if perhaps the creature is hungry, but it shows no interest in any of the various meats, fruits, and vegetables they've presented to it. The doctor stands in the doorway of the tent that has been set up to house the creature's cage and gives an update to General Machoy, who is anxious to get the creature moved to the United States and a more secure containment environment. Dr. Ketter stresses that he fears the journey might kill this creature, though, and put an end to the incredible research and testing they can perform on this amazing living specimen. The general turns to leave, but stops to salute the body of one of his soldiers being carried by on a stretcher. Dr. Ketter himself turns to go back to his research when he notices something. The creature's mouth is ever so slightly open. Dr. Ketter has yet another idea. That night, Dr. Ketter enters the temporary morgue and takes a severed arm from one of the dead soldiers. Back in the research tent, he presents the arm to the creature, sliding it through the cage bars. The creature doesn't react, but Dr. Ketter continues to watch and wait. After a time, the creature finally stirs. It's the first time he has seen it move since it was captured. The creature reaches out with its long three-fingered hand and grabs the arm before starting to feed on it. You like that, don't you? Dr. Ketter asks, and bizarrely, the creature seems to respond, giving an almost baby-like coo. There's lots more of that if you behave. All I want is to study you, learn how you work. The creature continues to feed, starting to crunch on the bones now that all of the meat is gone. Yes, I believe you'll be good, the doctor says as he approaches the cage. You're going to make me world famous. Soon, everyone will know the name Herman Ketter. The creature's hand shoots out from between the bars so quickly he never even saw it. Dr. Ketter starts to scream as it grasps and claws at him. A soldier standing guard outside runs in, but a black point of light immediately appears on his torso, causing him to fold in on himself into the singularity. The creature drops the bloody Dr. Ketter to the floor, who reaches for the emergency strobe light activation button as another singularity opens up inside of the cage. The creature appears to willfully step into it before emerging out of another just outside of the bars. More soldiers rush into the tent in time to see the creature feeding on the still living Dr. Ketter. One presses the button to activate the high-powered strobe lights, which cause the creature to start screaming and thrashing about, trying to escape the flashing lights. Multiple nets are fired onto the creature, pinning it to the ground as its screams slowly fade back to whimpers. On overseer orders, the creature is moved to ADRX-19, a secure base located somewhere in North America. The site's director gives a presentation to a group and explains that thanks to the work of the late Dr. Ketter, they now know that the creature exhibits signs of fear and sickness when in the presence of strobing lights, and that it is unable to produce the micro-singularities that it uses for defense and teleportation when it is in this sickened state. When healthy, though, the creature is extremely dangerous thanks to its superhuman speed, strength, and cunning. It was also discovered that it is unable to teleport through lead, which its new containment cell has been lined with, and extreme security procedures have been implemented, including the installation of a reinforced steel blast door and constant patrols of the outside of the cell by armed guards who are equipped with high-powered strobe lights. The site director leaves the room and the overseers discuss the fate of the creature, which has been given the designation number 86243AR-001, though most have taken to calling it simply 001. One of the overseers argues that the creature must be secured and contained in order to protect humanity. Who knows how many more of these might be out there? They now know that the rumors of these types of entities aren't merely isolated events, and that there could be countless more of these anomalies. Hundreds, maybe even thousands. The rest of the overseers unanimously agree. One of them picks up the report that was left behind by the site director. Redact this report immediately and start a new document archive. This is only the prototype. I have the feeling there will be many more of these. Hello everyone, Dr. Bob here. I know you're not used to seeing me here at the start of videos, but that's because today we have an extremely pressing matter to attend to. 
one that cuts to the deepest core of one of the SCP Foundation's deadliest contained anomalies, SCP-096, the Shy Guy. It's a creature that needs no introduction because it probably haunts all of your nightmares already. Close your eyes and picture it in your mind's eye, that gaunt face with the slack jaw and the lifeless white eyes, the face you hope never to see as long as you live, the pale skin pulled tight against bone, those impossibly long, gangly limbs. It sits there in its airtight containment cube, covering its face and quietly sobbing, always sobbing, as though cursing something beyond even its own understanding. Perhaps, when thinking about SCP-096, you feel a pang of sympathy mixed with the terror. After all, this anomaly is no sadist. Why would a sadist cry as it kills, like SCP-096 does? You're not alone in asking this question. I've spent many a night poring over classified files with an ever-freshening pot of coffee, trying to piece together the answers. SCP-096 is considered one of the most dangerous Euclid-class creatures in containment, and yet, so little about it is known, beyond its capability to do great harm whenever someone is unlucky enough to see its face and send it into its rage state. How did this happen? It's a question for the curious, like you or me, and after months of strenuous research, I believe I may have an answer. Whether you choose to believe it is up to you. Just be warned when you hear what I believe to be the heartbreaking, tragic origin of this terrifying and pitiful monster, you may never be able to look at him the same way again. Not that looking at him should ever be high on your list of priorities. It begins in a tavern in a small Nepalese village a few miles away from the Chinese border, where Mount Everest, the world's tallest mountain above sea level, waits. Its mere existence is like a challenge to the brave and foolhardy. Conquer me, it seems to whisper. Conquer me and declare yourself above all those I have conquered. Become a god among men. It's always whispering like this, but few, in the grand scheme of things, can actually hear it. And sadly for him, the explorer is among those few. He's sitting in one of the tavern's many cozy nooks, picking away at a plate of mutton curry while sipping from a brass bowl of white chiang, a popular local drink. The explorer, living up to his name, has come a long way to get here. The rest of the village locals in the tavern eye him with a variety of knowing glances. They've seen so many like him before, smug smiles and puffed chests, thinking they'll be able to count themselves among the exalted few who've conquered the mountain to end all mountains. The bodies of many men like this are still frozen to the mountain's surface. One brave local, an older man who can speak English fluently, slides in across the table from the explorer. The old-timer tells him that whatever he thinks he'll find up on the mountain, honor, glory, recognition, he'd be better off searching for it elsewhere. Death awaits on the icy rocks above. The explorer, young, fit, and still feeling mighty smug, replies that death is there for the people who haven't worked hard enough, who haven't prepared. He's scaled other mountains before, all across the globe, from Scotland to Peru. Everest would hold no surprises for him, just a new, compelling challenge. The old man is, as you could probably imagine, unamused by the explorer's hubris. All confidence and bluster now he says with his thin, raspy voice. But what will you say when you're face to face with the king? The explorer, assuming that this king refers to the mountain itself, <laughs> smiles and replies, I'll ask him for his crown. With that, the old man leaves, content that he at least tried to dissuade the explorer from going on this doomed journey. If nothing else, his conscience would be clear now. He had done all that he possibly could. The explorer, not bothered by the grim prophecies of superstitious locals, finishes his curry and chung and retires to the room he rented upstairs. He's so excited. Tomorrow, it will finally be time. All his months of training will pay off. He will climb to Mount Everest's peak. It would be an achievement to last a whole lifetime, one he would never ever forget, no matter how much he wants to. The next day, the tip of his ice axe cleaves into the mountainside as he grunts, strains, and pulls himself up another few feet. He's about 2,000 meters up, and every additional meter is fighting him. It's the bitterest cold he's ever known, a freeze so deep it makes his incredibly expensive thermal locking clothes feel like he's wearing wet, one-ply toilet paper. But the pain doesn't matter. The cold doesn't matter. He finds it exhilarating. Of course, just as the old man had warned, 
death could be waiting for him on this mountain, but the truth is, the explorer has never felt more alive. He winches himself up a few feet more, trying to regulate his breathing as his icy fingers, wrapped in thick gloves, struggle to find purchase on what feels like a sheer cliff face. There are many times when he's supporting his full body weight with only his hands, it often takes the kind of Herculean strength that only a lifetime of training can give you. After all, there's no room for error on Mount Everest. One wrong move, and you're either plummeting to your death or becoming a permanent frozen fixture of the mountainside. And because Everest is so dangerous, nobody comes to collect the bodies of dead mountaineering hopefuls. Their corpses, coated in often colorful winter jackets, litter the mountain. Some look at them as a tragic warning. Other, more morbid mountaineers use them as mile markers for their own more successful ascents. Whether the explorer would be lucky or become just another dead, frozen mile marker is still entirely up to chance. He climbs for a few more hours, pushing past his body's complaints, his physical limitations, until he reaches a well-earned plateau. Here, he establishes a small base camp and eats some of his rations. The area is thankfully guarded enough to keep out the worst of the sub-zero winds, so he can at least get some sleep without freezing to death. Mount Everest cannot be conquered today, and even someone with the explorer's bravado wouldn't dare to try. But as he settles down to sleep for the night, he can't help but look up and the enormity of what stands before him, he finds utterly terrifying. The mountain just keeps going and going and going, stretching up into the misty heavens, like the tip would only be a short jump from the moon. For the first time, the explorer begins to genuinely wonder, will I scale this mountain, or will I die on it? What he never even considers is that there may be a third option that's so, so much worse. Over the next few days, he keeps climbing further and further. Hundreds, then thousands of meters pass under him as he breaks past even the boundaries biology seem to set for him. He's impossible to deter, an engine of pure, burning willpower, going because he knows he cannot stop. Because he knows that if he throws in the towel now, it will have all been for nothing. He'll be just another failure, one speck among billions. He'll have no meaning, no legacy. He'll just be another average Joe forgotten. And that honestly scares him even more than the prospect of freezing to death up here. Eventually, even though it costs him almost everything to do it, he reaches 8,000 meters, an area known as the Death Zone, where it's believed to be impossible for humans to acclimate. This is the thin, rarefied air that few have been permitted to breathe, and he's seen so many brightly colored mile markers on the way to here. The ground is slippery, and the air chews into the explorer's skin but he knows he's made it this far. Less than a thousand meters from the peak now, he has almost conquered the mountain. So you can only imagine how surprised he feels when he sees another mountaineer walking down the side of the mountain towards him with an eerie kind of casualness. He's wearing standard mountain climbing gear, including white thermal pants and a hooded coat zipped up to the chin. The explorer can't make out the stranger's face beyond the pair of thick, black goggles he's wearing over his eyes. What the hell is going on here? The second the stranger's eyes fall upon him, he feels a frightening sensation. The bite of the cold is gone. The chilling winds can't reach him. Instead, he feels warm, cozy, and content, like he's sitting in front of a warm fire in a well-insulated log cabin. In any other circumstance, these sensations might be welcomed, but a seasoned mountaineer knows that this is actually one of the worst things you can feel. It means that death is creeping in, and your body is opening the front door and welcoming it. And if this stranger is causing that feeling, then one thing is certain, he's bad news. The explorer wants to turn and run, but he finds that he can't. It's almost as though he's frozen in place, entranced by the warm, inviting feeling that the other mountaineer seems to exude as he gets closer and closer. That's when the explorer notices something strange about him. Something is glowing through his goggles, like hot embers, burning a bright, luminous orange. Are those eyes? Dear God, are those his eyes? The explorer can feel their terrible stare, literally feel it. It hurts to be looked at by this monster. Yes, that's what it is. A monster. A monster in the shape of a man. Why are you here, mortal? Comes a booming voice from the inhuman mountaineer. Do you wish to challenge me? The explorer can't form words. He's quaking, 
his body acknowledging the cold that his mind can't as those two glowing eyes bore into him. Speak, the stranger commands. Who? What? Are you? The explorer forces out between chattering teeth. The stranger laughs. I am the king of the mountain. Though to the SCP Foundation, he's better known as SCP-1529, and he's the worst possible thing you can run into while trying to scale Mount Everest. The explorer remembers his conversation with the old man in the tavern, the question he asked, what will you say when you're face to face with the king? And his own foolish answer, I'll ask him for his crown. Now, really, truly face to face with the king of the mountain, all the poor terrified explorer can do is whimper and beg for mercy. Please, he says, the tears freezing on his cheeks as they fall. I just wanted to climb. The king of the mountain gives another booming laugh, his eyes burning. Then you will climb, he says, and climb, and climb, and climb. The king of the mountain must have wielded truly unspeakable power to do what he does next. With a simple nod, the explorer is suddenly hanging off of the mountainside, his fingers digging into the craggy rocks. The only thing supporting his weight. It was like being back at square one all over again, except with added pain, terror, and cold so deep he can feel his bones rattling. And all the while, he feels those eyes upon him, those burning, fiery eyes, staring with absolute malice. He keeps climbing. Every time he reaches a plateau, a place where he might camp and find even momentary comfort, the king of the mountain is already waiting there, staring that horrible stare. And just like that, the explorer was climbing again, wind whipping against him like forty lashes from a cat of nine tails. That, coupled with the endless strain of the climb on his muscles, is the worst agony he's ever felt. And yet, he never dies. Even though he hasn't eaten in days, weeks, months, years, he never, ever dies. He just fulfills the same torturous loop over and over again. It's like the King of the Mountain is just keeping him alive for his own amusement, a toy that's impossible to break. But while the Explorer never breaks, as time goes on and the torments never cease, he does begin to change, like rock being molded by the tide. First from the endless stress, his hair falls out, his skin goes pale from the lack of sun, his body becomes thin and wiry from starvation and malnourishment. The endless physical strain even warps his limbs. His arms and legs begin to stretch, his body becoming elongated and grotesque. All the way through this horrific, dehumanizing ordeal, the King of the Mountain stares at him. One day, the explorer, now changed, reaches a plateau, and as can be expected, the King of the Mountain stares at him with his burning eyes. The explorer cowers and covers his face with his hands, sobbing from exhaustion. He just wants the king of the mountain to look away, to leave him be. He babbles incoherently. He doesn't want to be seen anymore. His pain simply makes the king of the mountain laugh. I gave you your wish, the mountain king says, his voice oozing with contempt. You climbed, didn't you? You thought that your climbing would elevate you, make you more than human. But now, you're so much less. Our business concludes here. I'm tired of playing with you. And with that, the king is gone. The explorer is alone, stranded among the snow and the whipping winds of the death zone, but very much alive. He's finally able to go. At long last, after what felt like an eternity, he's escaped. When the explorer arrives in the village again, he's not the explorer at all. It's been years since he went missing on the mountain. The old man who had warned him not to go up onto Mount Everest had passed peacefully in the interim. The other members of his small village would not be afforded the same luxury. Instead, the explorer stumbled back through the village limits, still covering his face. The only sounds he can hear are the wailing wind and his own pitiful sobbing. Everything hurts. He's so terribly afraid. He needs somebody to help him. Why will nobody help him? The sun begins to rise, and the village shakes itself awake. People leave their homes to go about their daily tasks. None of them are expecting to see a monster loping through their streets, a pale, gangling monstrosity, stretched and hairless. It engenders a mix of fear and curiosity as it stumbles around, audibly sobbing with a loud, warped voice. It's like nothing any of them have ever seen before, like something out of a myth or a folktale. 
but for the monster that was once the explorer, it's so much worse. At first, he thinks that the villagers might be there to help him, but then he sees their eyes, that same intense, burning fire pit orange as the king of the mountain, that same horrible gaze that the explorer thought he'd escaped when he'd left the mountain, the gaze that meant pain, torment, and madness. Even when he tries to cover his face, when he wails at them to go away in words that make sense to no one but him, he can still feel those terrible eyes on him. Is he still on the mountain? Is he still at the mercy of the mountain king? Are these all just illusions or projections, another awful trick? What did he ever do to deserve this kind of torment? Was the crime of wanting to climb a damn mountain worth this kind of everlasting suffering? Did it earn him the gaze of all these monstrous eyes? The explorer begins to feel his anguish being replaced by another feeling, rapidly rising rage, the kind of pure blistering hatred that inexorably leads to one result, violence. First, he screams, then they scream, and finally, the killing begins. The creature that had once been the explorer leaves no stone unturned. Even when they try to run away, he still feels their eyes on him. He needs to kill them all, to annihilate them quickly, leave no trace. It's the only way he can feel anything close to at peace again. It becomes a kind of terrible chain reaction. The sound of the horrors going on in the street only entices more to come outside and see what's going on, to look at the creature causing all this carnage, to see its face. They have no idea that this very action is dooming them. And within the hour, the village is empty, save for one creature, the creature that had once been the explorer, now just afraid, confused, and alone. He will always be alone. The anomaly that will soon be known as SCP-096 simply bows its head and weeps. High in the Andes Mountains, two miners chip away at the rock with their mining picks in search of precious minerals when something strange happens. They hit an impenetrable wall. As they dust off the unbreakable surface they've reached, they see that it's a mirrored sheet of some strange metal. They start to break away the rock around it, revealing more and more of the shiny metallic surface until it suddenly disappears as if by magic. Behind it is a chamber with strange machinery and a mysterious metallic ball inside. The two miners look at each other in disbelief. What on earth had they just discovered? Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-163 also known as an old castaway. The Foundation soon caught word of the bizarre object that had been unearthed in the Andes Mountains, and immediately sent agents to secure the site. When they arrived, they found the metallic sphere was still there, though approximately 30% of the machinery originally reported to have been in the chamber had been looted before they could get there. Based on analysis of the rock strata in which it was found, the chamber appeared to be many, many years old and tests on the minerals present showed signs of a shockwave, indicating that whatever this was, it had crash-landed into the mountains. Upon examination of the metallic sphere, the agents found that it was a kind of machine, and one with a relatively simplistic interface. The agents deactivated the machine and were met with an amazing discovery. The mirrored ball was actually a kind of shield, and inside was something incredible a creature that could only be described as extraterrestrial, and it was soon to be designated SCP-163. The alien immediately lashed out at the agents, but they were able to subdue it and transport it back to a Foundation containment site for further investigation. SCP-163 is like nothing that has ever been seen on this planet. It stands two meters tall and is one and a half meters wide. Its body is roughly cylindrical, with a circular mouth on its lower body and something that resembles a head on top. It has eight legs, each with three joints that are arranged radially around the middle of its body. It also has multiple specialized limbs, including two prehensile apparatus on either side of its mouth to assist with feeding, two arms just below the head area that are capable of finer movement and the delicate manipulation of objects, two larger arms just above its legs that are used for the manipulation of heavy objects, as well as self-defense, and the remains of two appendages also near the mouth that appear to have been amputated at some point prior to its discovery. 30 centimeters from the top of SCP-163's head is a single semi-compound eye which wraps all the way around its head 
giving it complete 360-degree vision. The eye is separated into 88 separate units and is sensitive to ultraviolet C light, a short wavelength light that's harmful to most life on Earth. Its skin is transparent when exposed to the wavelengths of light that humans can see, but turns opaque under ultraviolet light. The strange properties of SCP-163 don't stop with what's on the outside. Tests of the creature's green-colored blood have revealed that it processes oxygen and carbon dioxide similar to many creatures on Earth, but its circulatory system is nickel-based, as opposed to the iron or copper-based systems used by most terrestrial organisms. It also has an endoskeleton composed of tissue that's similar to cellulose, the substance that plant cell walls are made of and its cells use DNA for instructions just like human cells do, with the same ACGT bases, but SCP-163 interprets those instructions differently from the way human cells do. All of these differences mean that SCP-163's home environment must be radically different from Earth's, with different types of proportions of elements present. Certain elements that are perfectly safe for humans are dangerous to SCP-163 and vice versa. Tests have shown that while it's able to survive in our atmosphere unaided, it will begin to show signs of illness after one hour. In order to stay alive, it's vital that SCP-163 continues to possess and maintain the universal life support device that was discovered with it, designated SCP-1631. The device is able to convert basic chemical elements into subsistence for 163, as well as projecting the protective metallic shield that it was found encased in. The other technology recovered from alongside SCP-163 has yet to be fully understood, though research is ongoing. The technology is surprisingly low-tech, with much of it consisting of transistors assembled into analog computers, with seemingly varied purposes. The processes these computers appear to be modeling do not match up with any known scientific processes, and it's theorized that they have something to do with 163's life support. It's still not known how or if it communicates complex ideas. When in certain states, it produces a steady sinusoidal wave at approximately 15 hertz that can last anywhere from 15 seconds to 10 minutes, and personnel that have been exposed to the sound have reported experiencing feelings of paranoia and are recommended to remain in well-lit conditions until the feeling subsides. SCP-163's main way of expressing emotion appears to be with the lump of tissue above its compound eye, and depending on how it feels, it will furrow its brow in a number of different ways. It has also been shown to display a positive response to something by rapidly beating its delicate upper arms together, and a negative response by doing the same with its two powerful lower arms. SCP-163 is to be contained in an enclosure with rooms for living, dining, work, and sleep as well as a receiving room with an airlock and seating that's appropriate for both 163 and a human researcher. The air in the enclosure is to be filtered and regularly checked for impurities, and there are two lighting systems, one that produces light within the human visible spectrum and one producing ultraviolet light. Personnel are to wear isolation suits at all times when in the enclosure to protect both themselves and SCP-163 from cross-contamination. Surprisingly, SCP-163, which has been classified as safe, is also free to leave its enclosure, provided it don its own isolation suit first, and is escorted by a researcher at all times. A number of experiments have been performed in an attempt to communicate with SCP-163 as well as determine its level of intelligence. In one test, a number of cards with images printed on them that depicted various human expressions and emotions were shown to 163. It did not appear to recognize any of them, but it did hold the 18th image shown up over the presiding researcher's faceplate. In another, it was given a test to see whether it was capable of selflessness and would offer help if given the chance. A researcher brought two wooden blocks and a box into 163's enclosure. The researcher opened the box and placed one block inside before closing the box. The researcher then tried to place the other block inside the box acting as if they were struggling and couldn't figure out why the block wouldn't go inside the closed box. After watching for 10 seconds, SCP-163 assisted the researcher and opened the box, a result consistent with how human children behave when given the same test. But the most unexpected result of all came when a researcher brought a canvas, brushes, and a selection of ultraviolet-colored paints to 163's enclosure. 163 immediately began painting after being shown how, and soon produced a painting of an alien landscape with never-before-seen plants and animals. 
SCP-163 stared at the painting it had produced for seven minutes before seeming to become angry, knocking the painting to the floor and retreating to a corner of its room. It furrowed the tissue on its head, indicating distress, and all attempts at communicating with it failed. That is, until the researcher tried to remove the painting supplies, at which point SCP-163 beat its heavy arms together to indicate its unhappiness. The next day, the researcher brought more painting supplies, and SCP-163 continues to paint imagery of what is presumably its home alien planet. It's truly amazing and lucky that SCP-163 was discovered. The Foundation is now monitoring all excavations of rock strata that are of similar age to the one 163 was discovered in. Perhaps one day another extraterrestrial will be discovered, offering 163 potentially a way home, or, at the very least, a friend. The young couple held hands as they walked through the forest, the only light coming from the full moon which streamed down between the branches. The young woman is riveted by her friend's story. She's never been a fan of ghost stories, she scares too easily, but her friends insisted. But what they didn't know was that there was something else out there in the forest, something watching them. The young woman can't help but look around, scanning the forest to see if there's anything out there watching her, but it's too dark to see anything past the dim ring of light cast by the campfire. Just then, something emerged from the forest. The couple had no idea that it was just feet behind them, matching them step for step. Slowly. It began to reach out towards them. What was it? The young woman instinctually asked. It was... The Gashadokuro! The young woman screams in fear as she is grabbed from behind by a skeleton. But of course, the laughing of her friends clues her in immediately that this is not a real Gashadokuro. It's just her stupid friend in a mask. No one can contain their laughter. Even the young woman has to laugh a little. As her friend takes off his cheap skull mask, she playfully hits him in the arm. You jerk! You should have seen the look on your... The gigantic shrieking skeleton leaps from the woods and picks up the young man, shoving him straight into his mouth and consuming him, the boy crying out as his bones are snapped between its enormous jaws. Everyone screams and turns to run, but another colossal skeleton emerges from the forest, picking up two of the group, one in each hand, before smashing them together over and over, leaving nothing but a tenderized pile of flesh between its bony fingers that it then begins to devour. The young woman doesn't know what to do. She's petrified with fear, unable to move or even think. She's grabbed from behind and turns to see her friend who is telling the story. Come on, we have to go. She still doesn't move. She can't tear herself away from watching the horror that's playing out in front of her. But he grabs her hand and forcefully pulls her into the forest behind him. As they run through the woods, they can hear the sounds of their friends being eaten by the enormous skeletons. There's nothing they can do to help them, though. All they can do is run. The two sprint as fast as they can through the thick, dark forest, jumping over fallen trees, hoping that there's solid ground on the other side. The young woman's foot catches in a root, and she falls hard to the ground. Her friend stops and quickly comes back. As he is helping her stand up out of the mud, they both notice something. A sound. The heavy thuds of another giant skeleton. And it's getting closer to them. Come on, we have to keep going! With a loud shriek, a huge bony hand emerges from the forest and grabs the young man. The young woman watches as he is lifted a hundred feet into the air and stuffed whole into the gargantuan skeleton's mouth. She steps slowly backwards, knowing that she will soon meet the same fate, until the earth disappears beneath her feet. She tumbles down the hillside, somersaulting end over end, crashing through the brush on the hillside until dropping over an embankment. If the fall down the hill knocked her out, then the drop over the embankment was enough to wake her back up. Her wits come back just enough for her to roll under the embankment's ledge, and not a moment too soon. She huddles under the ledge and watches as the two skeletons stride over her hiding place and continue on deeper into the forest. She listens until the sounds of their thudding steps disappear. She doesn't know what to do. Should she try to get back to the campsite and see if any of her friends are still alive? If they are, they might need her help. But what if there are more of these… things out there? What if they come back, looking for her? Her mind races, unsure of what to do, and she has trouble thinking clearly. Her ears are ringing from her tumble down the hillside and her teeth audibly chatter in fear. As she debates her next move, trying to make sense of the nightmare she's found herself in, she suddenly notices something. A shadow cast by the moonlight begins to grow on the ground in front of her. That's when she realizes something else. It's not her teeth that are chattering. The sound is coming from somewhere else. She stands up and turns around to see a huge skull slowly rising up behind her. The giant skeleton, this one even bigger than the others, reaches out towards her. 
The girl closes her eyes, preparing to meet her fate as the skeleton starts to shriek. But it's a different kind of sound. She opens her eyes and is almost blinded by the intense white light on the skeleton's face. It sounds like it is shrieking in pain from the light being cast on it, and she's forced to turn away and shield her eyes. As she does so, she sees the source of light. It's a man in a uniform. He looks like some sort of tactical police officer, but instead of a gun, he's holding an enormous flashlight that he's pointing at the skeleton. More men who are dressed just the same emerge from the woods, blasting the skeleton with more light. It continues shrieking but seems helpless to do anything. She watches as the skeleton seems to lose its form, slowly disintegrating in the light, until eventually it disappears completely. Later, the young woman is sitting in the back of a van with a blanket wrapped around her shoulders. One of the policemen, at least she thinks he must be a policeman, brings her a hot drink. She still can't believe what she saw that night. The monstrous creatures that killed and ate her friends, it felt like it wasn't real, like she was watching a movie play out. Were those… were those… Gashodokuro? She asks. A man in a white lab coat looks up from a nearby table where he had been working on something. She thinks he must be a doctor of some kind. Yes, he tells her, or something similar to them. Maybe they inspired the myth of the Gashodokuro? Maybe the myth inspired them. We simply don't know. She asks. All my friends are… Dead, he interjects. I know this is hard for you. Getting chased by giant anomalous skeletons and watching your friends eaten alive would be tough for anyone to deal with. The young woman starts to sob, the weight of the moment finally hitting her. But I have some good news, he tells her. She sniffs and looks up at the doctor. Believe it or not, I've seen this thing happen a lot. And you don't have to worry, because you're not going to remember any of this. Ouch! The young woman cries, and looks down to see that he has jabbed her in the thigh with a syringe. She tries to push him away, but she's already feeling weak and disoriented. She sways a little before her eyes shut, and she passes out. The young woman wakes in the cheery morning light of her own bedroom. She yawns and stretches, the strange dream about skeletons in the forest already drifting from her mind. Konnichiwa, I'm Dr. Bob, and today's file is a terrifying anomalous entity referred to in Japan as the Gashodokuro but known by the SCP Foundation as SCP-2863, The Starving Skeletons. SCP-2863 is not just one, but an entire population of entities that resemble gigantic human skeletons. These enormous bony creatures' size can vary, but on average they are approximately 30 meters tall. While their exact number is unknown, over 200 separate individual instances have been identified and catalogued with each having distinctive markings, such as their bones having different types of damage or burn marks present. SCP-2863 instances are currently found exclusively in Japan, where they will appear only after sunset. It is still unknown if the skeletons are sapient, though they do appear sentient as they engage in their primary behavior of hunting down and consuming humans. Despite their enormous size, they are capable of moving very quietly when they want to, though there have been reports from survivors of their appearance being preceded by a rattling-like sound, which may be their own teeth or giant bones hitting against each other. Once they have caught a human, they will immediately devour them, with the human's blood appearing to be absorbed directly into their bones, since they lack any digestive organs. It is unknown if they require the blood of humans for sustenance, or if their predatory behavior is motivated by something else. Monitoring and control of SCP-2863 instances was previously the responsibility of the Imperial Japanese Anomalous Matters Examination Agency. The IJAMEA, which as the name suggests, was Imperial Japan's answer to the SCP Foundation, tasked with investigating the strange anomalies within their own borders for the benefit of the Empire. Several of the IJAMEA agents who had been investigating the Gashodokuro at the end of World War II transferred to the SCP Foundation when the Anomalous Matters Examination Agency was disbanded and continued their work on the anomaly. They also provided their original files on the anomaly, which gave the Foundation their first information on the giant anomalous skeletons. According to the IJAMEA's translated file, Gashodokuro are created by mass death by the concentrated suffering of hundreds. While the Gashodokuro will eventually fade, they remain for centuries after their creation, lingering until their sorrow has diffused and faded. There is no way to hasten this process. The IJAMEA file also explained that while conventional weaponry is useless against the anomalous skeletons, light can be used to banish the creatures, and either natural daylight or man-made light will suffice. When exposed to light, the skeletons will start to lose their corporeal form until they fade away completely. This doesn't kill instances of SCP-2863 though, it only temporarily neutralizes them, and appearances of the same instance will often be reported the very next night. 
Just as the IJAMEA had noted in their file, the SCP Foundation also made the connection between SCP-2863 and locations of mass suffering. While Imperial Japan's anomalous investigation unit identified 203 instances of SCP-2863, the Foundation has since become aware of three others, each of which were found at sites connected to death and destruction. The first new instance was found near Nanjing, China, the location of an especially brutal massacre during the Second World War that may have resulted in as many as 300,000 deaths. It's believed that the entity first appeared in this location in 1938, just after the massacre. While the city was still under the control of Imperial Japan, this has led some to speculate that the locations where Gashodokuro appear are inherently tied to the borders of Japan as a nation and have fluctuated with geopolitical changes. The second was discovered several kilometers from Fukuoka City in Japan, a city that saw heavy firebombing by Allied forces during the war. The third was identified in 2011 in the Tohoku region of Japan, which is where the Fukushima nuclear disaster occurred. Each of these new instances appeared to bear injuries consistent with someone who suffered through the nearby tragedies, with the first showing evidence of crushed bones, the second appearing to have suffered intense burning, and the third missing teeth, which is common in cases of extreme radiation poisoning. These specific injuries add further evidence of the connection the Gashadokuro may have to human misery. The impermanent nature of SCP-2863 and their ability to manifest even after being neutralized has made long-term containment of this anomaly all but impossible, and they have been classified as Keter. In the event that an instance is spotted, Mobile Task Force Omicron 3 is dispatched to the area, where they will attempt to neutralize the entity through the use of high-powered floodlights. Any civilians who are exposed to SCP-2863 and survive are given Class A amnestics so that they can hopefully move on with their lives and forget their horrifying encounter with the starving skeletons. It's 1916, right in the middle of World War I, and a British soldier is huddled in a trench, occasionally peeking over the top. He's supposed to be on watch, but there's little to see in the darkness that hangs over no man's land. But then, he spots something. Something big. It's a shadowy figure, only about 20 feet away, and it looks like it's digging in the mud. It's too dark to make out what he's looking at, so the soldier shoots a flare into the sky, lighting up the battlefield with a dull red light. Now he can see it clearly, and it's like nothing he's ever seen before. A huge, terrifying monster, picking up bodies out of the mud. The soldier can only stare, petrified by what he's seeing in front of him, when the creature suddenly turns to stare back at him and smiles. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-3456, also known as the Orcadian Horseman. SCP-3456 is the designation given to a group of quadrupeds, of which the exact number that exists is unknown. These entities resemble horses, though with some marked differences. SCP-3456s lack any hair and their thick skin is translucent, revealing the fat and muscle underneath. They have three-toed hooves, and strangest of all, they have one or more human-shaped torsos fused to their backs. Each torso has a pair of arms and a head, but no legs, the torso seeming to meld directly into the back of the creature's horse-like body. The arms are much longer than those of a human, with a total wingspan that is double the anomaly's height. The arms are so long, they typically drag along the ground when the creature moves. At the end of each arm are five sharpened bones that protrude from where fingers would normally be. Instead of a nose, most instances of SCP-3456 have a hole in the middle of the face, which is capable of producing a high-pitched scream that is as loud as a jet engine. SCP-3456 instances vary in size with the largest recorded manifestation standing 30 meters tall and 15 meters long. Their bodies have also shown to be quite resilient and are completely impervious to conventional weaponry. The anomalous creatures have displayed a high level of adaptive intelligence, using complex tactics like setting up ambushes through the use of property destruction and psychological manipulation to lure targets into traps. This high level of intelligence has led many at the Foundation to believe that SCP-3456 is sapient. Any direct observation of an SCP-3456 instance will cause the entity to become aware of its observer, 
at which point it will display this awareness by turning in the exact direction of the observer. Once an instance of SCP-3456 has spotted its observer, it will engage in predatory behavior, stalking its witness and pursuing them far beyond the initial site of manifestation, all the while concealing itself and using camouflage as it chases them. SCP-3456 will repeat this behavior over and over, intentionally letting itself be seen by observers over and over as it hunts down and takes each one until it has captured a large number of individuals and suddenly dematerializes. It's currently unknown where SCP-3456 takes its victims or what happens to them once it dematerializes, nor is it known how many victims 3456 needs to capture before it is satisfied and dematerializes for good, as the number taken has varied between instances. It's not currently understood why, but SCP-3456 is either unwilling or unable to cross bodies of fresh water, and making it to the other side of a freshwater source like a river, lake, or even a stream is the only currently known way to escape the anomaly once it begins its pursuit. Instances of SCP-3456 typically appear near sites of mass human suffering, such as battlefields and natural or man-made disasters, and there have been numerous reports and sightings of 3456s at historical events throughout the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries with multiple manifestations often appearing at the same event. One Foundation report contains an account of an SCP-3456 instance appearing during the First World War at the Battle of the Somme. Rumors spread through the British troops in their trenches of the appearance of a mythical creature many believed to be the Nukalavi, a horse-like demon with origins in Orcadian mythology. Like many SCPs, this ancient folktale turned out to have very real origins. British infantryman Dave Harkand kept a journal which described giant hoof prints appearing in the battlefield mud, and soldiers disappearing under mysterious circumstances, appearing to be killed by forces even more terrifying than what the war could produce. Harkand describes one soldier who was firing on advancing Germans when the mud beneath his feet started boiling. Before anyone could react, mud went flying everywhere, and everyone was knocked off their feet. The soldier was gone, not even a body part remained and Harkand was sure he saw bony protrusions reaching up out of the mud underneath the soldier just before he disappeared. Not long after, Harkand spotted the Orcadian horsemen on the battlefield, and the horsemen spotted Harkand. He watched as the instance of SCP-3456 picked bodies out of the mud and carried them off into the darkness. He took several shots at the entity with his rifle, but the bullets had no effect. As days passed, the half-man, half-horse continued to appear night after night, always doing the same thing, picking up injured soldiers off the battlefield and taking them into the darkness. It would always look back at Harkand, seemingly taunting him or inviting him to try following it. Soon more instances of SCP-3456 appeared, many with more than one torso on their back. And then they began laying traps burying themselves in the mud and waiting for the soldiers to rush over them. Dave Harkand was declared missing in action at the Battle of the Somme, and it's presumed he was taken by the same instance of SCP-3456 that he first observed. Another first-hand account of an encounter with SCP-3456 occurred following the 2011 earthquake and subsequent nuclear disaster in Fukushima, Japan. With over 2,500 missing persons, Several manifestations of SCP-3456 were reported in the areas affected by the quake, and SCP Foundation reconnaissance teams were sent to investigate, two of which were quickly wiped out during the encounters with 3456s. One squad, after exploring the evacuated city and not finding anything, spotted an instance of SCP-3456 standing motionless in the middle of an intersection. As they laid eyes on the Orcadian horsemen, the human torso that was hanging limp off the motionless horse's body stood upright and began swinging its arms, damaging and destroying the buildings and structures around it. It then turned towards the team and emitted an ear-shatteringly loud shriek from the hole where its nose should be before beginning its pursuit. The team immediately began evacuation procedures, even ordering a drone strike in an attempt to slow down the chasing anomaly. The team took shelter in an abandoned high-rise building, 
but knew their only chance of escape was if they could make it over the nearest body of fresh water, which would mean crossing a bridge over the Arakawa River, which was a kilometer away. The team was 50 yards away from the bridge with no further signs of SCP-3456 when one emerged from a side street right next to them. Small arms fire was used against the creature and two rocket-propelled grenades were fired at it, but all had no effect. A flashbang detonated in the anomaly's face bought enough time for some of the squad to make it across the bridge and escape, but two members of the team were carried away by SCP-3456, with the last image captured by one of the squad's helmet-mounted cams being a shot of the Orcadian horseman smiling just before it demanifested. SCP-3456 is currently uncontained, and due to its extremely dangerous nature and the lack of any containment procedures, it has been designated Keter Class. Any personnel who observe the entity are to be treated with Class G amnestics, and their assigned treatment facility must be located within one kilometer of a body of fresh water. The Foundation has an ongoing project to attribute any historical references to SCP-3456 to myth, shell shock, hysteria, or PTSD, and any reports of loss of life or property damage involving the anomaly are to be replaced with explanations that attribute the cause to other natural or man-made events. Regions where SCP-3456 is more likely to appear are to be closely monitored with personnel ready to assist in evacuation efforts, but above all else, direct observation of SCP-3456 must be avoided, since once that has happened, there's very little even the SCP Foundation can do to protect you. A young man is in the middle of one of his regular night jogs through the park. He loves running through this park at night. It's dark, the air is cool, and the sounds of the city that surround the park disappear, offering peace, quiet, and a small reprieve from the busy world. He jogs along a path that winds through the park and starts upon a section that is surrounded on both sides by tall trees. He follows the path around a sharp bend and is stopped in his tracks. Standing there, in the middle of the track, is a figure. It has its back to him and isn't moving. He's tall and so uniformly black that he almost disappears into the night. Whoever or whatever this is, he's scared of it. But the creature doesn't move and neither does he. He's frozen, unsure of what to do, when the creature suddenly turns his head towards him, revealing a pair of bright, glowing eyes. The runner is so terrified he can't even scream. He falls and crawls backwards in the dirt, trying to get away from the creature. The creature turns its body towards him and begins stepping forward. The runner scrambles to his feet and runs. He's sprinting as hard and as fast as he can, adrenaline pumping, heart pounding trying to put as much distance as he can between himself and that, that thing. His muscles burn, his lungs ache, but he can't stop. Finally, he's back at his house. He bursts through the door, locking and bolting it behind him. His girlfriend is reading on the couch and doesn't understand what's going on. After struggling to catch his breath, he tries to explain what he saw on the path, but his girlfriend just laughs. A giant man with glowing eyes. He was just seeing things in the dark. It was probably a dog, nothing that would justify the panic he was now in. The next day, he's left wondering if he really was mistaken. Those piercing, glowing eyes are burned into his mind, though. Maybe his girlfriend was right, and it really was just a dog. Yes, that must be it. His mind was just playing tricks on him in the dark. Even so, he's going to stick to running inside, at least for a little while. But he soon finds that he's having a hard time. He notices that he's running out of breath much quicker than normal. Is he coming down with something? He doesn't feel sick, but then why is he suddenly so weak? Two weeks have passed since he saw something in the park. No one he brought it up to, not his friends, not his co-workers, have ever heard of such a thing, and no one seemed like they believed him either. At this point, he is feeling sure that he really did imagine it, but he can't get that image of whatever it was out of his head. He can't keep running on a treadmill forever, though. He misses his night runs. It's time to get over his fear. He's running through the park again, enjoying the silence and the light breeze on his skin. He continues down the path, acutely aware that he's getting closer and closer to the spot where he saw that thing before. He can't stop, though. He has to prove to everyone that he's not afraid. He has to prove it to himself. He reaches the part of the path that runs through the tall trees. Just like before, the sounds of the city melt away. The only sound 
coming from his steady, heavy breathing. He follows the winding path and feels his heart starting to race, but he has to keep going. He rounds the same corner and nothing is there. He slows to a stop. Of course nothing is here. Nothing ever was. He really did imagine it. Or did he? Buongiorno. Today's file comes from the Italian branch of the SCP Foundation, SCP-015-IT, also known as the Boogeyman. SCP-015-IT is a humanoid entity that stands just under two meters tall. Its body is devoid of any hair, and its dark, black skin absorbs 98% of all light, making it virtually invisible in low light. Its head lacks a nose or ears, but these missing features are hardly noticed, because if you see 015-IT, its eyes are what demand all of your attention. While the boogeyman's skin is completely black, its eyes contain light-producing organs on the irises, causing them to glow in the dark, like a deep-sea predator. Its mouth contains eight pointed teeth on both the upper and lower jaws, and a long 28-centimeter forked tongue. The two tips of its tongue each have a hollow, needle-like organ that leads straight into its esophagus. More on what it does with that specialized biological feature soon. Physically, SCP-015-IT is rather slight, but it is surprisingly strong and easily able to overpower an adult human. Its skinny arms are much longer than an average human's, and each of its four fingers ends in a razor-sharp claw. It has also been shown to be quite resistant to physical injuries and possesses the ability to heal wounds and damage to internal organs at a hyper-accelerated rate. SCP-015-IT is primarily active at night, which is unsurprising given its skin's natural camouflage in the dark. The Boogeyman hunts mammals, with humans being its preferred prey. But it does not feed on flesh. Instead, SCP-015-IT draws its sustenance from the adrenaline and noradrenaline produced by its quarry. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are chemicals the body produces to increase heart rate, blood flow, and provide more energy to the muscles in moments of stress, or in the case of SCP-015-IT, extreme fear. And it has developed a hunting method to cause this exact reaction in humans. 015-IT will usually hide in dark spots, trying to keep out of sight as much as possible as it stalks its next victim. If it has been able to remain unseen, it will wait for a moment when its prey has become distracted so it can silently approach them. Once close enough, it will leap towards its unaware victim, grab them, and quickly bite them on the side of the torso, near where the adrenal gland is located. It uses its large teeth to anchor its mouth in place as it uses the needles on its forked tongue to probe into their body. With one needle, it pierces directly into the adrenal gland and begins draining the blood that is now rich with fear-induced adrenaline. At the exact same time, the other needle releases a mild sedative, allowing 015-IT to feed and then depart without risk as the victim remains immobile. Another anomalous effect occurs when someone is unlucky enough to actually see the boogeyman. Roughly two weeks after observing the creature, the person who saw it will begin experiencing various detrimental mental effects, including hallucinations and panic attacks. Some will also begin to experience physical issues, most often damage to the cardiovascular system. It is unknown why exactly these mental and physical effects occur, but it is theorized that SCP-015-IT may use it as a way to weaken certain prey that it considers too strong or potentially dangerous. In 2011, the Boogeyman was actually contained, but not by the SCP Foundation. The Brotherhood of St. George's Knights is a secret order in the Catholic Church that was created by the Pope in the year 453 to either contain or eliminate all anomalies, and it was this group that first captured SCP-015-IT, which they designated as DIA-212 in line with their own classification system. While it was in their containment, they made a number of discoveries about the creature that they labeled as a shadow demon. First, they found that while it feeds on the fear of its victims by ingesting their blood, it doesn't actually require this to survive. DIA-212, as they call it, is an unstable entity, and feeding allows it to maintain its physical shape in our reality. In addition to its impressive physical strength, the Boogeyman is also quite intelligent, as seen by its ability to successfully hunt, attack, and escape from humans. Strangely, it also appears to be resistant to weapons which have been blessed, causing only a fraction of the physical damage that they should when compared to a similar, non-holy version. 
During the course of research into the creature, Father Ilardi, a member of the Brotherhood of St. George's Knights, wrote that despite the creature being repugnant beyond every limit, he believed that it had a gentle soul and that its screams are similar to a pained cry. He postulated that SCP-015-IT may have even once been a human before some dark force transformed it into the monster that it had become. He decided that it was his mission to find a way to communicate with the creature, and one day bring it back into the light and love of his god. Father Alardi was making good progress with the creature, and it seemed like it was even growing fond of him and his disciples. But his advances were halted when they were attacked by a group of soldiers from the Fascist Council of the Occult, a terrorist group that seeks to use anomalies as weapons in their quest to disrupt the social order. In the attack, several of the Brotherhood were killed, and in the commotion, SCP-015-IT escaped. Following this, reports soon began to come from the province of Caserta that described what sounded like vampire attacks. A mobile task force was sent to the area, and while 015-IT was initially able to make use of its various physical abilities to evade and escape capture, it was eventually shot with a transmitter that allowed it to be tracked. The Italian mobile task force was able to surround the creature, but fearing being contained again, it responded with a level of violence that it had not been thought capable of. Several members of the task force were killed in the line of duty before the boogeyman could finally be subdued. Today, SCP-015-IT is contained at Site Vittoria in the Emilia-Romagna region of Italy. Since this anomaly is both sentient and highly unpredictable in its behavior, it has been classified as Euclid. It is kept in a standard humanoid entity containment cell and is monitored by video cameras and infrared sensors at all times. Due to the light-absorbing properties of its skin, its cell and the adjacent corridors are painted white and are to be kept well lit at all times. Twice a day, SCP-015-IT is given a normal, domestic pig that it is allowed to feed on. Any personnel assigned to 015-IT duty must undergo a psychological assessment on a weekly basis, and, regardless of the results, must be cycled out after three months of exposure to the boogeyman. The explorer slashes his way through the jungle, using his large machete to hack through the thick undergrowth. He suddenly stops and turns around. Which way was it again? His local guide answers, but he must wait for him to finish and his research assistant to translate. He says to continue straight, it's just another hundred yards or so. The gentleman explorer offers a quick nod, before turning to resume cutting his way through the forest. The guide was right though, because after a short way, the dense jungle suddenly opens up, giving way to a clearing that reveals one of the most incredible things the explorer has ever seen. Just ahead of him, rising out of the forest, is a massive, ancient stone temple. A huge step pyramid of solid stone, intricately carved and covered with elaborate statues. The colossal structure looks like it has been abandoned for centuries if not longer, with nature having done its best to reclaim the stone and cover the pyramid in vines and other plants. The team approaches the temple, but stops in front of a stone monument that stands in front of it. The explorer traces its carved lines with his finger, knocking the dirt away to reveal its weathered pictograph. It appears to depict a sort of creature, but with large spread wings instead of arms. Perhaps a kind of ritualistic garb, the explorer says to his assistant. The assistant hastily scribbles in her notebook, trying to document everything she can. Yes, this is definitely a priest-like figure of some kind, maybe a leader of this temple thanks to the connection he shares to their… The explorer's musings are interrupted by his guide, who he angrily spins around to face. Yes, what? What is it? His research assistant translates for him as usual. He says that we should go no further, that it's too dangerous. Nonsense, replies the explorer. We came all this way, and who knows what fantastic treasures await us inside. Historical treasures, I mean. Artifacts. Treasures of knowledge, of course. Of course, replies his assistant, before following her boss as he starts making his way up the step pyramid, as the guide holds true to his stated intentions and waits near the edge of the jungle. The two of them walk through an entrance that leads into a long, dark hallway. With only torches to light their way, it's impossible to see just how deep it runs into the temple. The explorer stops to examine the walls, which are covered in even more carvings. He can see that there are complicated geometric patterns, but also many more depictions of the same winged creature that was on the monument outside. Here though, the creatures are depicted in moments of action. They appear to be running, chasing, reaching out and grabbing for… people. They are shown attacking them, picking them up, carrying them away to… right where the pictograph story should reveal its climax, 
is a chunk of missing wall. It must have fallen off at some point. Ah, oh well, the explorer declares before moving on to explore more of the temple. His assistant doesn't follow, though. She spots several pieces of stone on the floor underneath the missing panel and kneels down to get a closer look. She begins to gather them together, rearranging the various pieces back into their original form. Meanwhile, the explorer's attention has been caught by something else. On the other side of the hall is a statue of a tall, proud warrior, and in his hand he clutches a large bejeweled spear, the gemstones adorning it sparkling in the torchlight. The explorer reaches out and grips the spear's handle. He begins to pull, perhaps being a little rougher than one should with an ancient artifact, but he wants this fabulous jeweled piece, and even more than the spear itself, he wants the acclaim it will bring him back home. As the explorer pulls on the spear, his research assistant moves the final piece of the broken wall carving into position. She holds her torch over it to get a better look, and she gasps. The winged creatures are carrying people away, but that isn't the end of the story. They are bringing them somewhere, and she can even see now that they are being presented to an even bigger winged creature. It's a monster. A monster that is feeding on the people. The assistant turns to tell the explorer what she has found, and just as she does, she watches as he is finally able to rend the spear loose from the statue's grip. The statue finally letting go causes him to fall backwards to the ground, where he lies, marveling at the beautiful jeweled spear in his hands. Look out! yells his assistant. The explorer doesn't notice that the statue is precariously rocking back and forth, and he rolls out of the way just before it crashes down right where he was lying and admiring the spear. Are you okay? she asks as she rushes over. I think so, he tells her. Just a little bump on the head. Nothing that can't be fixed up by a good... By a good what? she asks, but he seems distracted by something behind her. By a good... By a good... By God, what is that? He points, and the research assistant turns to see something emerging from a hole in the wall where the statue once stood. It's one of the creatures from the wall carvings. A bizarre half-man, half-lizard, with wings instead of arms. Though there's no flesh at all, the creature is completely made of bone. The two of them both scream at the skeletonized half-human, and the creature screams right back at them, emitting a shrill, high-pitched squeal. Suddenly, more of the creatures begin to emerge from the hole in the wall, with others crawling out of previously unseen and unnoticed holes in the walls and ceiling. The creatures rush towards them, blocking their way out of the temple, and the pair have no choice but to run further down the darkened hallway. As they run, more of the creatures emerge from holes in the darkness, screaming at them and grasping at them with the sharp claws on the end of their wings. As they round a corner, one reaches out and grasps the explorer's ankle, causing him to trip and fall hard onto the stone floor. His assistant rushes to his aid, but as she is helping him up, two more of the creatures appear behind her and envelop her in their bony, winged arms. The explorer stands up and stabs at one of them with the jeweled spear as they drag her into a dark hole, but a third tears it from his hands. With more still coming down the hallway behind him, the explorer has to run. The hallway in front of him looks to have collapsed at some point in the past, and he has no choice but to enter one of the dark tunnels that has been carved into the rock. The narrow tunnel winds back and forth, and the explorer is unsure of where he is going or what his plan is. He rounds a bend, and the tunnel opens up into a gigantic room. The ceiling must be over a hundred feet high, and he can't see the furthest walls, with the only light emitted by his torch and a dim beam of sunlight coming down through a hole high up in the ceiling. He notices, too, that it has suddenly gone quiet. He turns and looks back at the tunnel he has just emerged from, and notices that the sound of the horrible creatures that were chasing him has ceased. The explorer hears something coming from deeper in the giant room and turns back, peering into the darkness. There, in a single beam of light, he sees one of the winged creatures, but it is moving strangely, as if it isn't walking but floating up into the air. And that's because it isn't walking. As it gets closer, the explorer can see that the winged creature is stuck on the tooth of a giant, monstrous mouth. The huge winged creature emerges from the darkness into the beam of light, tossing back its giant head to consume the creature that was stuck in its teeth, its bones loudly cracking in its mouth. Now, in the light, the explorer can see that the monster, which itself must be hundreds of feet long, is a huge flying lizard of some kind. Or at least it was at one time, since now the majority of its body is made only of bone. What scraps of flesh are left hang off in rotten ribbons. The monster opens its mouth and roars at the explorer. Its foul breath smells like a mausoleum opening up, hitting the explorer in the face. The explorer tries to run, but the monster swipes out with a bony wing that still has a few blackened strips of leathery skin on it and knocks him to the ground. He is pinned to the floor with a huge spiny claw as the creature opens its mouth 
roaring again before moving its head down to start feasting on its meal. The explorer closes his eyes, bracing himself to be eaten alive. When the creature suddenly lets out an ear-piercing scream, the explorer opens his eyes to see the jeweled spear sticking out of one of the few spots of flesh remaining on the creature's clawed foot, and gripping the shaft is his assistant. She looks a little worse for wear, but she's alive. She offers him a hand to help him up. They need to get out of there. But first, the explorer pulls the spear from the monster's claw. The two start running, doing everything they can to avoid the monster as it claws and swipes at them. They spot an illuminated opening at the other end of the vast room, and with no other option, start heading towards it. As they get closer, they can see it's just what they needed. Daylight. Escape. They both slide to a stop at the cusp of the opening, nearly tumbling over the edge. On the other side, the tunnel opening up out of the side of the temple gives way to nothing but air and a drop of hundreds of feet down to the jungle below. They turn to see the monster still rushing towards them, and without time to think any longer, they both jump, just seconds before the creature snaps its bony jaws in the place where they were standing. It's too big to fit anything more than its mouth out the door, and it howls and screams as they fall through the air before crashing into the ground below. The assistant slowly opens her eyes to see someone. It's their guide. He is cradling her head and asking if she's okay. She sits up, dazed and more than a little bruised from her fall. She asks the guide where the explorer is, if he's alright, and the guide lowers his eyes, looking as though he'd rather not answer. He points next to them without looking, and the assistant turns to see the explorer lying on the ground a few feet away from them, his body impaled on the jeweled spear. History is full of tales and legends about gods, monsters, and everything in between. But not all of these are just stories. And in fact, sometimes the reality is even more terrifying than what we could envision. And that is exactly the case when it comes to SCP-4959, also known as the Teotihuacan Pterodactylactery. SCP-4959 is a huge creature that resembles a pterosaur, which were flying reptiles that existed during the Mesozoic era. While pterosaurs have been extinct for millions of years, SCP-4959 is very much alive, or at the very least, animate. This massive anomaly, whose wingspan stretches approximately 50 meters, is in a living state of decomposition, with roughly 70% of its flesh having rotted or otherwise fallen away, leaving only small patches of skin and decaying tissue clinging to its bones. The flesh that does remain shows no signs of further decomposition though, as if it is permanently locked into this specific stage of advanced decay. Tests of 4959's flesh have shown no apparent abnormalities, save for a slightly higher than expected concentration of iridium. Its eyes are no longer present, but the eye sockets somehow shine with a bright green light, though the source of this luminescence is unknown. When angered, the creature also emits a multicolored corona of fire from its wings, skull, and neck. SCP-4959 was discovered in a gigantic chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent in Teotihuacan, Mexico. A number of tunnels connect to the chamber, and these too are anything but empty. Lurking within the temple's many twisting passages are entities that have been designated SCP-4959-A. These humanoid-sized creatures appear to be constructed of various human and pterosaur bones, creating an all-new creature that is an amalgamation of both. The bones are connected to a central stone-like heart, but it is unknown if this heart was carved from stone, or if it was at one time a real heart that turned to stone through a process of ossification, nor is it fully understood just how the bones are connected to it or stay together. The 4959-A entities also have a number of varying adornments on their bodies which can include strips of decayed fabric, feathers, and precious stones that resemble those worn by the indigenous people who resided in the area many centuries ago. SCP-4959 is carnivorous, though it is unknown if it requires or simply desires to feed. Regardless, it seems to be the task of the SCP-4959-A entities to bring it meals, since the 4959 creature itself is too large to leave its chamber beneath the temple. The hallways and passages that originally connected the temple to the chamber housing SCP-4959 have all collapsed, and the only tunnels now leading to it were most likely dug into the rock and earth by the 4959-A entities. They search through these tunnels, most often working at night, looking for small animals like birds and lizards, but also occasionally finding a larger animal or even a human who has somehow found themselves inside. They will then bring their live prey directly to the giant pterosaur, offering them up as both a meal and a sacrifice. SCP-4959 will then proceed to eat the prey whole, sometimes consuming the 4959-A entity at the same time as well. 
temple itself is covered in carvings and murals that give numerous hints as to the origin of SCP-4959. While it is unknown just how it got there, it appears as though the local people discovered the creature within its chamber and regarded it as an avatar of their feathered serpent god, or perhaps another unknown deity. A temple was constructed at the site, and they soon began making sacrifices to the god creature that lived beneath, starting with small animals but then progressing to human sacrifices on important holy days. There is also something else shown in the murals that looks to be of great importance. It seems as though SCP-4959 possessed a sort of heart, which is depicted as a large gemstone, described as being red as blood and bright as the rising sun. This gemstone was previously housed at the pinnacle of the temple, though its current location is unknown. Following intense study of the site by SCP Foundation historians, a narrative was pieced together that may explain at least some of what happened there. It seems as though there was an uprising within the local population in roughly the 6th century AD. A conflict had arisen amongst the people as to whether this really was a god, or something else, something evil. Those who doubted the deific origins of SCP-4959 wrested control of the temple and journeyed into its depths to attempt to kill the creature. The many scorch marks on the wall are a testament to the battle that likely took place, and while they suffered many losses, it appears as though they were at least able to seal the chamber shut. It is currently unknown what became of the great jewel on top of the temple after this, but its location is of great interest to the Foundation given that it may well be the source of SCP-4959's longevity. SCP-4959 has been classified as Euclid, and it continues to be contained within the chamber beneath the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, though all of the tunnel entrances leading into it have been blocked by reinforced gates. If new ones are discovered as the result of SCP-4959-A's continued tunneling, they too are to be gated and sealed. Once per week, a large live animal, most often a cow, is deposited down a shaft that leads directly to the chamber, and so far this seems to be keeping SCP-4959 content to stay within its tomb. Just what is SCP-4959, and what are the half-man, half-pterosaur creatures who serve it? Are they former human sacrifices, now destined to live in eternity in servitude to their master? If SCP-4959 was a god at one point, the fact that we are now the ones responsible for feeding it and keeping it happy means that in a sense, we are the ones serving it now. It's day 9 of Joseph Mann's expedition into the extreme wilderness of Antarctica. He's been following the tracks of a mysterious creature, a massive, anomalous beast that has been spotted in the snowy wastes. As he follows the tracks, he sees something. It's his own tent, but he had been walking for days after leaving this camp. How was he back here after only a few hours? Time and distance were starting to feel off, like they were stretched out and folded over into knots. Maybe he was confused about the tracks. Maybe he hadn't been chasing after something, but following the tracks of something that had been chasing him. Maybe he was wrong about everything. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-2764, also known as the Eldritch Antarctic. SCP-2764 is a massive biological entity, standing over 380 meters tall and estimated to weigh over 150,000 metric tons. It possesses around 80 tentacle-like arms that it uses for movement and simple actions like grasping objects. It also has what looks to be a head with four eyes. SCP-2764 possesses a number of anomalous properties, including the ability to communicate telepathically with humans, though the language used changes based on the person who is receiving its messages. Strangely, this communication appears to go one way only, as it has never demonstrated that it understands any attempts to communicate back to it. Its physical state has also been observed to be quite anomalous. Its size does not follow normal Euclidean geometry, with the creature appearing many times larger or smaller than it should based on the viewer's distance from SCP-2764. There appears to be a critical zone lying roughly 50 kilometers away from the creature that stretches around it in a circle. As you move away from the creature and approach this line, SCP-2764 actually appears to grow larger until the critical zone is passed, at which point it begins to shrink as you move farther and farther away. Its body has a number of other strange properties too. Its tentacle-like arms rapidly translocate around its body at random intervals, jumping around all over its body creating a twitchy, writhing mass that makes it impossible to count how many tentacles it actually possesses. But perhaps strangest of all is that not only do the creature's arms seem to break the laws of physics by jumping around its body, 
but so too does the entirety of SCP-2764. It's been observed to spontaneously relocate itself to different places, as if it is flickering in and out of existence. It appears that the creature flickers into a new place like this at random intervals, but it may be following some yet unknown rules, as it has never been seen appearing more than 25 kilometers away from where it was last seen, and always flickers back to its original location within 48 hours. SCP-2764 was first discovered by a civilian team that was conducting detailed surveys of the Antarctic landscape. The team observed the creature, and were immediately alarmed by its strange properties, especially its bizarre geometric qualities. They returned to their home base and described what they had seen to a colleague, who was actually an SCP Foundation researcher in charge of investigating anomalous activity in Antarctica. This researcher sent word back to his superiors, who activated Mobile Task Force Eta-5, also known as the Jaeger Bombers. Eta-5 administered amnestics to the survey team and any other exposed civilians before setting up a perimeter around SCP-2764. What they would eventually learn was that the perimeter they established was far too close. In his investigation logs, MTF-805 Commander Joseph Mann noted that he immediately experienced strange anomalous effects, such as how the creature seemed to shrink the closer he got to it, and the strange voices in his head. His curiosity soon got the better of him, and he decided to do some of his own research into the entity before the rest of the SCP Foundation scientists and guards arrived to take over the investigation. Mann gathered a couple volunteers who were also curious about the nature of the anomaly and set out on an expedition to gather more information. Just as they had experienced before, the more they walked towards the creature, the more it appeared to shrink in size. They also made note of strange prints in the snow. At first, they looked to be human prints, but then seemed to change into something that looked as if a squid had pulled itself onto the land and was dragging itself through the snow. After several days, the whole team was hearing voices. They also realized they had left their tissue analyzer back at a previous camp and would have to backtrack to retrieve it. As they moved away from the creature, they expected it to now increase in size, but it didn't. It stayed the same. Either something had changed about the anomaly, or SCP-2764 was moving towards them. After recovering the tissue analyzer, they continued on towards the creature again. Commander Mann began to understand the voices he was hearing and could even make out certain words like snow and back. Their perception of time was affected too. Hours seemed to stretch out or pass by in the blink of an eye. The voice he was hearing started to become more direct and the message was clear, turn back. Mann was compelled to press on though, even with the extremes of the Antarctic cold beginning to weigh on him. But then, SCP-2764 suddenly vanished flickering out of existence, and the team was left with no choice but to follow the strange tentacle-like tracks in the snow, hoping they would lead to the creature. The tracks led them back to their old tent, the same one they had left the tissue analyzer at before, which should have been impossible based on the time and distance they had walked. Just then, Commander Mann realized that he had been wrong. They were the ones who had been pursued. They hadn't been following the tracks forward, but backwards to where they had been. Even worse, he realized that his team had disappeared. He was completely alone. Commander Mann continued to trudge through the snow, walking without direction, when he spotted SCP-2764 again. It was circling him, trying to maintain its distance, but he raced towards the creature and sliced off a piece of its flesh for analysis. Something strange happened when he placed it in the analyzer though. The machine displayed a zero, which was the reading for human tissue. This strange result required further analysis from the Foundation researchers who should now have arrived to take over the investigation, so Mann began to make his way back in the direction of home. He spotted what looked to be members of his team off in the distance, and assumed that they must be on a mission to rescue him. Try as he might though, the spatial anomalies prevented him from ever getting closer. It felt like it would take him an entire day just to walk a few feet. He assumed it must be the same for his rescuers, as he watched them off in the distance, seeming to never get closer. At one point, he could even see as they stopped and turned back, appearing to return to an old campsite. He couldn't understand what they were doing, but then they disappeared entirely, only to reappear much closer to him. Commander Mann, now sure that there was something terribly wrong happening, tried to approach the now single rescuer he could see to tell him to turn back, but before he could. The man rushed at him with a knife and cut a piece of his flesh from his back. 
It's at that point that Commander Mann finally started to understand. He hadn't been watching a rescue team come for him. He'd been watching himself. He had been walking towards the creature, and yet, at the same time, he had also always been the creature. Commander Mann was trapped in a time loop where he was doomed to transform into the monstrous SCP-2764 and then watch himself meet the same fate over and over again, forever. The voices he had been hearing telling him to turn back were his own, words of warning that he was doomed to always ignore. SCP-2764 has been classified as Keter and is currently located in a classified area of Antarctica. A 150-kilometer radius has been established around the object, which is to be monitored at all times by Mobile Task Force Eta-5. Any civilians that come within the 150-kilometer radius either by accident or due to SCP-2764 flickering to a populated area are to be administered Class A amnestics, and any civilians that may have knowledge of the event are to be administered Class B amnestics. Should any civilian or Foundation employees come within 30 kilometers of SCP-2764, they are to be detained and immediately questioned. Following their psychological examination, and depending on the results of the evaluation, they will either be administered Class A amnestics or terminated. If he breathes, the bear will see him. Lying flat in his stomach, the boy has no choice but to watch as the hulking brute eats his father before his very eyes. Lying in the thicket just a few trees away, the boy knows that any small movement he makes could prove fatal. A bear this large, hunting for its hibernation, will have no issue chasing him down in a split second and doing exactly what it did to his father, to him. The boy is utterly powerless. All he can do is stay deathly still and watch. They'd found the tracks too late. On the way back to camp, they'd been following the wooded cliff that lines the ocean's edge. Bows and salmon slung over their shoulders, they'd been so proud of their catch and the prospect of bringing it back to the tribe that they hadn't kept their wits about them. By the time they'd seen the enormous prints in the dirt, the sound of lumbering footsteps were already echoing through the trees behind them. The boy's bow is too far out of reach. He dropped it when his father pushed him into the thicket. He's got the knife hanging at his side, but he doubts it's long enough to even get through the bear's fatty hide. In contrast, the only thing protecting him from its bite is the leather hide slung across his shoulders and a woven garment from the tribe's elders. One slash of the bear's claw, and he'd be… A breeze ruffles his hair. The boy's eyes widen in horror. That wind hadn't come from in front of him, but from behind, blowing his scent, his fear, directly towards the bear's nostrils. The boy plants his muddy palms into the dirt, staring at the animal. Its nostril twitches, then twitches again. It half turns its head, sniffing the air. Maybe it won't bother with him. The bear's turning back to its meal already. The boy lets out a sigh of relief, and a twig snaps. The bear snarls and whips its head around. For a second, the two of them lock eyes, predator and prey. Then the boy takes off running. Fast as he can, he leaps through the undergrowth, ferns and nettles whipping at his shins. He fumbles the knife out of its sheath and slings the water skin off his shoulder, throwing it wildly behind him. He doesn't know if he hit the bear. He doesn't have time to turn around and see. It's going to be on him in an instant. Up ahead, he sees sunlight streaming through the thick trees, the cliff edge. If he can just get to that, maybe he can climb down and… No, there's no time. Besides, bears are better climbers, better swimmers, better runners. All the boy can hope for is that he's a better jumper. Him and the boys from the tribe have left off plenty of cliffs along the shore, but never these ones. There are too many rocks, too many shallows. But the thundering of four enormous paws behind him is looming larger and larger. He can almost feel the bear's hot breath on the back of his neck. There's nothing for it. Here goes. The trees clear, the sun blasts his skin, a claw slashes at his back, and the boy launches himself into the air. The wind carries him. The weightlessness of wheeling his arms and legs through the empty sky is almost enough to make him laugh with joy, until the boy looks down. The cliff is higher, much, much higher than he'd realized. His momentum carries his torso forwards into a tumble. He's not going to land straight, and he can see jagged rocks everywhere beneath him. The boy closes his eyes and crashes into the sea. All of the air is slammed out of his lungs. His knee hits something hard and sharp in the water. A swell throws him away from the shore and pulls him deep. Without air in his chest, he can't float. Kicking hard as he can, the boy swims upwards, eyes still screwed shut. His face bashes into a sandy rock. No, that's not upwards. 
Which way is it? Which way should he swim? The ocean current rolls him over and over. Darkness fills his mind. But his feet find a hard surface, and he pushes against it, launching himself through the water, kicking as hard as he can. The darkness fades. Light. The boy's head breaches the water, and he splutters for air, rubbing the water out of his eyes. He looks around wildly. The sea has carried him away from the cliff and out into open water. It's lifting and dropping him with each wave, carrying him this way and that, like a flower in the wind. And there, traversing the cliff face, scrambling down the rocks, is the bear. The boy's stomach turns. It reaches the bottom of the cliff and sees him there in the water. Tipping back its head, it roars at an almighty volume, deafening the boy over the sound of the waters. Even from this distance, the animal looks impossibly large. It dwarfs the boulders that line the water's edge. It slips into the water, barely making a ripple, and kicks off from the shore. Going straight for him, the bear is covering the distance so fast, he only has seconds left. With barely the strength to keep himself afloat, the boy knows he'll never be able to outswim this creature. Instead, he takes a deep breath and looks up at the woods, remembering all of the happy moments he'd spent in there with his father. A current swells beneath the boy and almost throws him out of the water. An enormous shadow flies through the depth beneath him. A whale? It couldn't be. Whatever it is, the shadow is swimming straight at the advancing bear. So fixated on its prey, the bear doesn't even notice what's approaching until it's too late. The ocean explodes. A blast of water as tall as the cliffs themselves shoots up into the air and showers the boy's head. Somewhere in the midst of the spray, a monster erupts from the depths. Snapping its jaw around the bear, it lifts the animal into the air and throws it against the cliff. The impact is so strong that a small landslide follows the bear's rolling body as it tumbles back towards the water. But the boy has eyes only for the monster emerging from the sea. Crawling up the rocks with one gnarled foot after another, the boy can hardly make sense of what he's looking at. It seems to have some kind of scaly hide, harder than the rocks surrounding it. A wave crashes against the monster as it leers over the bear and sinks its teeth into the animal's hide. Unable to look away, the boy kicks out and starts swimming away up the coast. Only once he's a long way around the bay does he dare to clamber out and back onto land. That night, once the rest of the tribe have gone to sleep, the boy can't help but lie wide awake in his tent. Without his father here, it's just… it's not the same. Quietly rolling up the high doorway, the boy slips out into the night. They're camped by a small cave with beautiful smooth walls inside. They say it's the cave of their ancestors, the place where all life started. The fire in the cave has to always burn. Fortunately for him, the cave is empty. The boy stares up at the wall in wonder finger drawings of animals, hunters, mothers, shamans, gods, and forests fill almost every part of it. Only one space remains in the corner, the finger painting of the rocky cliffs with the swelling sea beneath. Dipping his finger into the paint, the boy sits by the wall and starts to paint. A terrible monster crawling out of the sea with a scaly hide stronger than any rock. That's it. You know that from just some finger painting. The archaeologist turns to the group of researchers surrounding him in the cave. UV lights are set up all along the walls, with the blue and violet shapes revealed all across the stonework. The archaeologist can't help but empathize with the spiritualism of their long-forgotten ancestors who would lived in these caves thousands of years ago. The professor was the one who asked the question. A cold woman, standing well over six feet tall with a crop of fiery ginger hair. To him, she seems less of a scientist and more of a military leader. But what does he know? Walk with me, she says and leads him out of the cave. Personnel fills the surrounding area. Most of them are armed. Cranes lift huge sheets of reinforced lead plating into place. Several mysterious vats line the edge of the forest, each adorned with more warning and hazard signs than you'd see in a nuclear power station. The two of them have to pause for a moment as three tanks roll past them. The archaeologist breaks the silence. You know the reason I started all my research in the first place? Did I ever tell you that story? Every early civilization in the world, whether it's ancient China, Mesopotamia, South America, Northern Europe, all these cultures, you take a look at their mythology and what do you find? The professor ignores him, instead choosing to bark orders at a group of agents talking over coffee. They all immediately dump their drinks and get back to work. What one thing do they all talk about, even though it never existed? Dragons. All these disparate people with no contact with one another, all of them still draw pictures of dragons. The professor stops walking at the edge of the cliff. The pair of them stand there, surveying the vast ocean stretching out in front of them as researchers, agents, and workers rush around behind them. 
After a long pause, the professor asks him to proceed. In ancient Hebrew texts, when they talk about God creating the world in seven days, what happens on day five? The professor flicks the hair out of her eyes and replies curtly, God created fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Well, not exactly. Look at the original Hebrew. He created all of the fish that teem in the seashore, but he also created Leviathan, serpent-like monster from the depths, as old as the world itself. You think that's what we're dealing with? Maybe. Or something worse. By nightfall, preparations are operational. Enormous floodlights switch on, one after another, illuminating an enormous steel box with an open lid at the top, surrounded by armed agents, huge net launchers, and several tanks. It all seems a bit excessive as far as the archaeologist is concerned. He isn't officially still supposed to be here, but in all the scramble for the Foundation to get the capture site ready, no one noticed that he had stuck around. From the viewing platform several hundred meters away, he has to watch it all unfold through a pair of binoculars. Out above the water, suspended from one of the cranes, is an elephant carcass. The professor told him that the Foundation had even marinated it for extra flavor. He had only been recruited into this project a couple of months ago, but from what he could tell, it's been an ongoing priority for the Foundation for several years now. The scale of the operation of just setting up at this site is already mind-boggling, but they've been chasing up leads like this for years now. Arriving at scenes, they suspect this creature has been sighted in the past and setting up traps for it. He was only brought in out of desperation. The Foundation had exhausted all recent hunting grounds and was trying to cast the net even wider. He'd just been quietly working on his university research paper about ancient reptile drawings when the agents had let themselves into his office. But staring through his binoculars now, the archaeologist knows there's no chance of this operation actually working. They have floodlights for crying out loud. No intelligent predator would come anywhere near that elephant carcass. Movement. Not in the waters or any of the lit-up areas. No, there's something in the forest line, just behind a group of researchers. He reaches instinctively for his walkie-talkie, then stops himself. How many times had he got jittery before and reported something preemptively? The agents already don't take him seriously as it is. He can't be jumping at shadows. But there it is again, a shape moving fast through the trees. He scans the binoculars this way and that, trying to find it. Just a group of researchers there, some agents there, supply crates, researchers, agents… Wait, weren't there more of them a second ago? He looks closer. Someone's gone missing. He clicks on the radio. Uh, South Lookout Team, report in. Nothing. South Lookout Team? A sickening feeling settles in his stomach. With all those bright lights everywhere, they're casting a lot of dark shadows. He has to do something fast. Running down from the lookout point, the archaeologist takes off running through the trees to the site. He holds his radio up to his mouth as he goes, trying to get anyone to respond. But it's hopeless. The thicket cracks and crunches under his feet as he tries to make his way through the dark woods, ignoring the feeling that crawls up his neck of being watched. A boulder blocks his way. The archaeologist grabs onto it with both hands and hauls himself on top of it, stopping for a moment to catch his breath. From up here, he can see the floodlit capture site. The tanks and cranes still sit rumbling ready to go at a moment's notice, but he can't see any ground crew anymore. He switches the radio to the open channel and calls out for anyone to respond. The professor's voice crackles back at him. What are you still doing here? This is a highly dangerous operation that you don't have clearance for. He yells at her to cancel it. They need to evacuate the site immediately. It's compromised. She laughs derisively and cuts off the channel. No, she has to believe him. People are dying, and more of them will if she doesn't... The archaeologist whispers to himself in the darkness. It's no monster. It's just an innocent creature. You're playing with a power you don't understand. It's strange. For a moment, he swears he almost hears a voice whispering something back to him in the woods. But when he looks around, he's all on his own. He has to keep moving. The creature could be anywhere. Hopping off the jagged boulder, the archaeologist takes off running through the forest once more, looking over his shoulder every few steps. The light must be playing tricks on him. In the darkness, he can't see the boulder he was standing on a moment ago anywhere. He bursts out of the tree line and into the clearing right next to the steel box. A ramp leads up to the top of it, with a large trap door suspended over the open lid. Well, if he wants to be seen and heard, that's where he needs to go. The archaeologist runs up the ramp and waves his hands wildly in the air. The tanks all turn their turrets to aim at him. The crane holding the enormous steel lid for the enclosure looms menacingly above his head. And there, marching out onto the field, looking absolutely furious, is the professor. Her red hair looks more like a ball of flames right now. We need to evacuate the site now! It's here! 
Archie snarls and marches up the ramp to meet him, jabbing a finger in the archaeologist's face. He suddenly realizes how much taller she is. You are not jeopardizing our one chance of catching this thing. Get out of the way, or I will have you detained. Besides, what evidence do you have? But the archaeologist isn't looking at her. Instead, his eyes stare in horror at the elephant carcass suspended behind her. There was a huge, reptilian bite mark taken out of it. A testing bite, like the ones given by sharks. She turns to follow his gaze, and all of her rage is washed away in a sickening delight. It's here. A scream from the crane holding the elephant makes them both jump, but by the time they look up at the cabin, all they see is a hulking shadow leaping away into the darkness. The professor clicks on her walkie-talkie and starts issuing commands. No one responds, except the tank crews. She tries again. Radio silence. Now the gravity of the situation really starts to hit her. Eyes wide with panic, she runs off down the ramp, barking into a radio and leaving the archaeologist up here on his own. Suddenly, under all of these lights, he feels very exposed. It could be anywhere in the shadows. Footsteps, heavy planted footsteps tremor through the ground, and out of the woods walks the creature. Several meters long, fat from all of its hunting, the beast that would soon be known as SCP-682 slinks into view. It looks up at him, standing there on the trap door over a metal box, and looks like it's almost ready to laugh at how easy this will be. Boom! The tank blast hits the creature square in the torso, knocking it sideways. Boom! 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 The three tanks open fire one after the other, laying round after round into the colossal reptile, kicking more and more dust into the air. Before long, there's a crater in the ground so large that it looks almost like an asteroid hit it. Smoke and dust fill the air. The archaeologist's eyes fill with tears. That majestic creature, roaming the earth long before mankind ever did, exterminated just like that. Cowards. That's what people really are. Cowards. But as the dust clears, a groaning sound echoes around the clearing. The archaeologist shields his eyes and peers into the crater as best he can. But there's nothing there. Boom! He wheels around and almost falls backwards in shock. The SCP is snuck through the haze and leapt onto one of the tanks. It bites and tears at the armored bodywork, doing all it can to destroy it. In a panic, two of the tanks point toward one another and fire, destroying themselves in the process. The creature rounds on the remaining tank and bites down hard on the barrel. The tank fires, the round going straight down the monster's throat and exploding inside its gut. The backdraft from the blast shoots back through the tank, and a puff of smoke trails out of the hatch at the top. And suddenly, once again, the clearing is quiet. Turning back to the archaeologist, SCP-682 slinks towards him, smoke still curling up out of his leering teeth. With heavy, thunking steps, it climbs the ramp towards him, stopping just short of the trap door. The two of them stare each other in the eye, predator and prey. Neither move for a moment. Then it opens its mouth. The archaeologist closes his eyes. Do you know that you disgusting creatures deserve this? He opens them. Did the monster just speak? What do they hope to accomplish by attacking me? He gulps hard. That whisper he heard in the woods, the rock he'd been standing on. They're scientists. Scientists always try to learn more things, understand the world better. We think you can't be killed, so we're there testing their hypothesis. The creature growls. The stench of rotten flesh fills the archaeologist's nose. It takes a step towards him, then another. The archaeologist runs. He'll leap off the other end of the platform. It's a big jump, but he could make it. The predator's breath is on the back of his neck. He jumps, just as the trap door gives way. With an enormous thud, the SCP falls into the steel enclosure. Before it has a chance to move, the crane unhitches the steel lid, and it crashes down into place, sealing the monster inside. The archaeologist lands in the dirt and rolls onto his back to see the professor, wild-eyed and cheering, up in the crane's cabin. He lies there on his back, panting and staring up at the stars. A clunking sound echoes through the clearing and the gurgle of a liquid flowing through pipes. He sits up, adrenaline still pumping through him. The professor has plugged a pipe into the metal enclosure and is running gallons and gallons of liquid into it. He follows the tube with his eyes, all the way to the enormous hazardous vats on the edge of the clearing. Hydrochloric acid. His eyes widen in horror. The professor laughs at him. Come on, cheer up. We're just scientists, that's what you said. 
Just testing a hypothesis. The full moon hangs heavy in the night sky over the dense jungle canopy. Below, the darkened palm trees stand silent in the humid air, festooned with vines and lianas, and tropical insects hum in the undergrowth. The night is quiet and dark here, far from the city, in one of the farthest, most secluded provinces of the Philippines. One would hardly expect anyone to be out at this time of night. The young woman is hurrying home, carrying a lantern before her face so that she can see where she's going in the pitch black of the night. Her swollen belly reveals that she's at least several months pregnant, her new middle throwing her off balance just enough that she has to be careful not to stumble. A woman in her condition, she thinks, shouldn't be out at this time of night and certainly shouldn't have to do household chores like this. But the work has to get done, no matter what. She carries a basket of wet laundry under her other arm. She is returning from washing her clothes in the river and, if she had planned things out better, she would have been home long before the moon rose. Unfortunately, she spent far too much time gossiping with several other village women before getting to work on scrubbing her filthy clothes against the rocks. Luckily, it's not too far from the river back to her home in the village. The worst thing that might happen, she reminds herself, is that she might lose her footing in the dark and trip over a rock or a root. There's no chance that she might run afoul of some nocturnal animal, she tells herself, even though the sudden chills down her spine and sweat dripping from her brow reveals the truth, that she doesn't believe that at all, and, in fact, she's getting more and more nervous as she staggers through the dark. It isn't just the threat of wild animals. She remembers the stories that her mother told her when she was a little girl, all about sinister supernatural monsters that live in these woods. Of course, those are just stories invented to scare children, she tells herself. She's a grown woman now, about to have a child of her own. She shouldn't be worried about boogeymen. She just needs to keep her head on her shoulders, and she'll be sure to arrive home safely. The lantern throws its light over a figure standing below the crook of a catmon tree. The woman jolts, nearly dropping her laundry. She gulps back a scream as she realizes that what she sees isn't a wild animal, but rather a person. Oh, sorry, says the young woman, her voice shaking a little. I didn't think anyone else was still out this late. I thought you were a wild animal. Don't you worry, little one, says the figure in a soft, sibilant voice. The figure steps forward, and the young woman recognizes her. It's an old woman from the village, her back hunched and her long white hair falling over her shoulders in a messy tangle. The young woman feels inexplicably nervous running into this particular villager here in the jungle at night. Many of the village kids whisper that she's actually a witch who has all kinds of weird supernatural powers. Even some of the village elders are afraid to cross her, for fear of getting cursed. Where are you going at this hour? Someone in your condition shouldn't exert yourself so much. I'm just heading home, says the young woman, hefting the basket of laundry for emphasis. It's dangerous to be out so late alone. Here, let me walk home with you. There's safety in numbers, you know. Th thank you. The young woman almost wants to protest that she doesn't need any help getting home because she really does not want to spend any more time with this old woman. But at the same time, she is reluctant to say anything that might insult her. After all, even if the young woman doesn't believe in witchcraft, it's not like she wants to take any chances. Besides, the truth is that she is rather frightened of being alone in the dark, and any company is better than nothing, even if it's this strange old woman. How far along are you, honey? says the old woman, placing a hand against the surface of the young woman's protruding belly. The young woman grimaces. She doesn't like this old woman intruding on her personal space like this. The old woman's hands are wrinkled and veiny, flecked with liver spots, and her fingers topped with gnarled talons. The young woman wants to cry out at the sight of them, but she bites her tongue. Instead, she answers the old woman's probing question as calmly and politely as she can. Very nice, very nice says the old woman, her roomy eyes never straying from the young woman's belly, and her hands still rubbing against her stomach as if she's trying to reach something within. The old woman makes a strange sound in her throat, like she's smacking her lips in hunger, but it's hard to see anything in the dark. The young woman can only nod in confusion, but she quickens her pace. She hopes that she can get home soon, and once she's home, she can get away from her unfortunate travel companion. The old woman keeps pace, grabbing her younger traveling companion by the arm and holding tight. Her grip is surprisingly firm for such a seemingly frail old woman, and the young woman again wonders if maybe there's something supernatural about this ominous crone. She wants to pull her arm away, but the old woman's long claws pinch cruelly into her flesh. It's as if the old woman is silently warning her, don't pull away, 
I'm too strong for you to escape. What a sweet little bundle of joy you carry there, says the old woman, as if speaking to herself. What a delectable little burden. The young woman knows that she's still talking about her unborn baby, but all this mumbling just makes her more worried. They continue walking, the young woman staring resolutely at the small circle of illumination thrown by her lantern onto the path ahead, doing everything in her power to not look at the old woman standing at her side for fear that she might scream. Why is she so nervous? Worse, does the old woman sense her fear? The young woman has heard that witches are easily offended, and that's the last thing that she needs now. She continues walking, the old woman gibbering and whispering in her ear, plying her with odd questions about her pregnancy. Eating well, have you? You know, it's very important to eat right when you're carrying, so that the baby can be born strong and healthy. Right, says the young woman. She really doesn't need this unsolicited advice. She heaves an audible sigh of relief as the village comes into view over the next bluff. Thank God, she thinks, I'm almost home. She just hopes that the old woman will take a hint and leave her alone once they arrive at her doorstep. She wonders if this old woman might try to come into her home or maybe steer her towards some other destination. But what can she do? All she can do is keep walking home and hope for the best. Is it just you, is it? Is the father in the picture, hmm? I haven't seen you with any young men lately, have I? Asks the old woman. Her nosiness is really starting to irritate the young woman, enough that she almost forgets her fear. No, it's just me, says the young woman automatically. She immediately regrets that confession. What is this old woman planning? Is she up to some mischief? Now she knows that the young woman lives alone, and there won't be anyone around to see whatever this crone is planning. Her grip tightens on the young woman's arm as if to warn her again. The village is quiet and dark. Everyone else has already gone to bed by now, so the pair of them walk down narrow, still streets. The only sound is the crunch, crunch, crunch of gravel under their feet. After what seems like an eternity, they arrive at the front gate of the young woman's house. Well, here I am she says, a little too loudly and firmly to be completely casual. This is my home. Thanks for keeping me company on my way home. To her immense relief, the old woman lets go of her arm. The young woman immediately pulls away, rubbing the deep bruises left by the old woman's gnarled talons. Think nothing of it, my dear. The old woman smiles widely, a long rope of saliva dribbling from her slack lips. Her teeth look jagged and misshapen. It's hard to see in the dark, but they look more like the teeth of a wild beast than a human. It must be your eyes playing tricks on her in the dim light, though. The young woman can't help but recoil in disgust, but luckily her face is hidden in shadows, so the old woman doesn't seem to notice. I'm happy to help. I hope to see you again very soon. The young woman doesn't wait any longer. Even before the old woman turns to leave, the young woman scampers across her yard and yanks open her door. She runs inside and pulls the door shut behind her. Her heart is racing, and her breath comes in ragged pants. She can feel the baby in her belly kick, suddenly agitated by its mother's fear. Shh, it's okay, she coos softly, patting her stomach and hoping that her tender voice will help to calm her baby. I know you're scared. I'm scared too. That old woman frightened me half to death. They say that she's a witch and I'd almost believe it. What a strange experience. She pulls the curtain aside and peeps out the window. The old woman is gone. The young woman looks up and down the street but sees no sign of her traveling companion. She inhales deeply and feels the tension drain from her body as she lets her breath out. Thank goodness that's all over. She can't explain why this whole night has unnerved her so much, but there was just something so uncanny about that strange old woman. She's glad to be rid of her. The young woman tries to put the whole experience out of her head as she prepares for bed. As she pulls on her nightclothes, she startles when she hears something heavy and loud clatter across the roof. It's not unusual for roof rats or other nocturnal animals to scurry across the roof at night, but this sounds louder than usual. It's probably nothing, she tells herself as she climbs into bed. I'm still just upset about meeting that old woman on my way home from the river. That whole thing must have jangled my nerves worse than I thought if I'm flinching at every little sound. I'll be fine when it's light out. The sooner I get to sleep, the sooner it'll be morning. Even though her nerves are rattled, she is quite tired after a long day and it doesn't take long before she drifts off to sleep. The young woman's eyes close, and her breathing becomes slow and steady, the shallow rhythms of sleep. Inside her head, she might be troubled by strange dreams, but to any outside observer, she is dead to the world. Asleep in bed, she doesn't react to the clattering on the roof. 
Whatever is up there is making an awful racket as it drags itself over the roof tiles. If someone were around to watch, they would see that whatever is on the roof is no rat. It's a darkened figure, almost big enough to be human, but strangely truncated. Two massive leathery wings unfurl behind it, extended to help the strange creature maintain its balance upon the roof. It drags itself forward using only its hands, long talons tapping at the roof shingles as it seeks a loose tile, anything that will give it access to the house below. Its finger finds a crack. Wheezing and panting, the creature leans forward, putting its eye to the crack to peer into the room below. The young woman is asleep in bed directly below, and that's exactly what this creature was hoping for. The young woman mumbles in her sleep, her mind filled with disturbing dreams. She's oblivious when, all of a sudden, something drops through that crack in the ceiling. It's long and slippery and covered in thick, wet mucus. It looks, for all the world, like a tongue, but it's far too long to be any human tongue. It drops lower and lower into the room, extending closer and closer to the young woman sleeping in her bed. The disgusting appendage caresses her face, leaving a wet slug trail of saliva across her forehead as if it's looking for something, then brushes against her lips, and the tongue seems to find what it wants. Instantly, it snakes into her open mouth and shoots down her throat. The young woman starts to sputter and choke, her limbs thrashing and flailing, but still, she is held fast in the grip of sleep. Some wild nightmare is playing out in her head. Perhaps she fantasizes that she is drowning in a river or choking on some food or being strangled by a fiend. Whatever she's thinking, it couldn't be further from the truth that an alien tongue has jammed itself down her throat. The tongue pushes deeper and deeper inside her until it makes contact with her womb. A trained anatomist might balk at the idea that the tongue could find her womb by accessing her throat, but somehow it has done exactly this, snaking its way through the labyrinth of her insides to find her unborn baby. A sticky aperture opens up at the tip of the tongue, revealing that the tongue is hollow, like a massive soda straw. It sucks up the baby like a vacuum, slurping it up, 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 and out, the bulge of its prey traveling up the length of the tongue like a wild pig swallowed by a boa constrictor. Once the baby is gone, the tongue slides out of the woman's mouth and retracts back toward the ceiling, disappearing back through the subtle crack. There's a clatter on the roof again, followed by the soft flutter of leathery wings. The young woman settles back into a deep, still sleep, the awful sensation of suffocation having passed. The rest of the night is peaceful and quiet, but when she awakens the next morning, she finds that the nightmare isn't over. She wakes with a strange, empty feeling in her guts. Something is very wrong. She throws aside her covers and stares at herself in shock. Her baby is gone. Her rounded belly has deflated back to its pre-pregnancy state, and she can sense, as only a mother can, that she is no longer carrying something within her. She shrieks in terror at this bizarre revelation. What could have happened? What could be responsible? That young woman just had an encounter with SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is a humanoid subspecies native to the Philippines, dubbed Homo sapiens visceralis, but known by many local names across the Philippine Islands, including the Oswang, the Tik Tik, or simply the Viscera Sucker. But it is most commonly known as the Mananangal. During the day, an instance of SCP-5201 looks like an ordinary human, at a glance, there is no way to immediately distinguish an instance of SCP-5201 from a regular member of Homo sapiens. However, Foundation researchers have found that there do exist certain retinal irregularities unique to SCP-5201, so the agency has developed a portable retinal scanner for use in quickly identifying instances of SCP-5201. SCP-5201 is far easier to tell from an ordinary human at night when it undergoes a strange and startling metamorphosis. It unfolds a pair of membranous wings, resembling those of a bat, from its back. Even more startling, its torso splits in two. Its upper torso then flies off in search of prey, while its lower torso is hidden in a secure location until SCP-5201 can reconnect. SCP-5201 will seek out human prey, most likely relying on a keenly attuned sense of smell, and, once it has chosen a victim, will alight on the roof of their home and then snake its preternaturally long, tube-like tongue into the house below so that it can feed. SCP-5201 feeds by inserting its tongue into the orifices of unfortunate sleepers and sucking out their internal organs as easily as you would suck soda through a straw. SCP-5201 will happily eat human livers, stomachs, and intestines but its favorite food is unborn fetuses, so much so that instances of SCP-5201 disguised in their human form 
can often be recognized by their tendency to drool at the sight of pregnant women. SCP-5201 are well known to local humans who live in fear of nocturnal attacks by the dreaded Mananangal. Interestingly, SCP-5201 can be repelled by Abrahamic holy objects like rosary beads or crucifixes, or can be staked through the heart with sharpened shafts of bamboo, very similar to the means used against vampires in Western folklore. SCP-5201 is especially vulnerable when its upper torso is out hunting, so it will always take the utmost care to hide its abandoned lower torso in a secret, secure location. If you can find the hidden lower torso, it is possible to kill SCP-5201 by sprinkling its exposed viscera with spices like garlic, salt, or vinegar, or failing that, even ash or urine. This causes an unusual reaction that is not yet fully understood by Foundation researchers, but will prevent the two halves from rejoining. If the two halves of the Mananangal cannot rejoin before dawn, sunlight will kill the creature. If none of these methods are available, it is also possible to repel SCP-5201 by using a specialized whip fashioned from the tail of a stingray. The SCP Foundation currently has an undisclosed number of domesticated SCP-5201 instances held in the fauna containment wing of Site-235. Because this species has been known to practice cannibalism, each specimen is to be held in its own personal containment cell. While there are obvious ethical and logistical concerns with feeding human organs to SCP-5201, the Foundation has discovered that SCP-5201 can still easily thrive on a diet of any newborn mammal with a mass of at least one kilogram. Piglets have so far proven to be the most cost-effective and available options, but other species can be substituted as necessary. All entrances to SCP-5201 containment cells are to be guarded by at least two Level 2 personnel equipped with stingray whips, crucifixes, or some other object found to cause harm to SCP-5201. Unlike humans, SCP-5201 have an unusual asexual reproductive process. The lower body can regenerate a new upper torso via a process similar to epimorphic regeneration observed in autonomous lizards. Upper torso of an SCP-5201 would leave behind the parent's lower torso to search for a compatible female human. SCP-5201 would attack and consume this human, claiming her lower torso as its own smearing ash, urine, or spices into the exposed innards of the lower torso inhibits this process and prevents effective reproduction. The exact origin of SCP-5201 is unknown. Although the creature is endemic throughout the Philippines, and historical records indicate that it has inhabited the island since at least 1500, when it was first described by Spanish sailors to the islands, fossil remains and genetic testing indicate that it is actually an invasive species from outside the Philippine archipelago. SCP-5201 is currently believed to be extinct in the wild, following eradication efforts by the Foundation in the 1990s. An epidemic of SCP-5201 attacks in the early 90s prompted the SCP Foundation to join forces with the Supernatural Committee of the Philippines and the Global Occult Coalition to take action to prevent SCP-5201 from spreading to other countries. Dubbed Project Dipsy, the operation involved amnesticizing the major cities of the Philippines, funding propaganda campaigns to dismiss SCP-5201 as a product of folklore and urban legends, and eventually domesticating the surviving SCP-5201 population for cellular regeneration research. Because of its aggressiveness and taste for human flesh, SCP-5201 specimens regularly attempt to breach containment and thus have been given the designation Euclid. And while the SCP Foundation has done its best to eliminate the threat of SCP-5201 in the wild, there's no guarantee that a few instances of this vicious monster might have slipped through the cracks and possibly even spread out into the wider world beyond its home in the Philippines. You still might want to search your room for any suspicious cracks or holes before you bed down for the night, because there are very few things less pleasant than waking up from restless dreams to find a long, slimy tongue jammed down your throat. It is November of 1966 in Point Pleasant, West Virginia. It's a crisp, clear night, the kind of natural beauty only autumn in Appalachia can bring. The lush green mountainsides have gone fiery as the season changed from summer to fall, vivid oranges, reds, and yellows flooding the landscape and turning the hills into a sunset. Now, in the dim light of the moon, the colors are muted but still glorious, dancing in a silvery blue glow. The spooky fun of Halloween has come and gone, leaving the warm, cozy feelings of the harvest. A fresh-pressed apple cider, corn mazes filled with happy families, cuddling up around the fire with a flannel blanket and a mug of something hot and sweet. 
Some people think Christmas is the most romantic time of the year, or Valentine's Day, or spring, when the wildflowers bloom and the breeze carries their perfume through the town. But to at least one happy couple, this is the most romantic thing they could possibly imagine. They're a young man and a young woman, driving down the winding country road. They're so in love, and they feel like the only two people in the entire world. At this moment, life is good. They're driving just to drive, to crank up the radio and enjoy being alone together. But after a long stretch of road with nothing much in sight, they decide to drive a little bit further away from town, over toward an area nicknamed the TNT area for its former life as a World War II munitions plant site. Now, of course, it's just mostly wildlife out there, but it'll look beautiful at night, and it should be completely private. As the car winds around a curve in the road, the woman thinks she sees something out of the corner of her eye, and her heart skips a beat, taking her back to long-forgotten childhood fears. As a little kid, she always used to get nervous driving at night, imagining a monster running alongside the car as it went, trying to catch her. She used to picture long, pale limbs and big eyes, something loping along on all fours, dipping in and out of sight between the moonlight and the shadows. She would have nightmares about what the creature might do if it ever caught up to the car, if it ever reached through the window and pulled her out into the darkness. But of course, that was just a flight of fancy, the sort of thing a bored child's mind cooks up on a long drive. Imagining monsters where there are just dead tree branches or nocturnal animals. But now, seeing motion in the forest out the window, she feels that same breathless terror she felt as a little girl. She doesn't even realize she's squeezing her boyfriend's hand too tight until he pulls it away with a wince. Easy, before you crush me. He laughs, but there's worry in his eyes. You okay? She nods, shaking off the feeling. Sure, I'm fine. She privately chides herself for being so silly, for letting her own imagination get the better of her. She's lived in Point Pleasant all her life. She's no stranger to wildlife. Animals come out at night sometimes. It's just as much their world to live in as it is hers, she reminds herself. She's just starting to settle in, to let herself relax. When she sees it again, a fluttering motion, like great big dark wings, flapping at the edge of the area illuminated by the headlights. Something about it, the way it moves, the way it shimmers in the light that seems to shine right through it like black mist, it feels deeply wrong. Like the old stories her grandfather used to tell her about the things you see in the mountains late at night, things you never want to come close to. He'd once told her about a mountain lion with the face of a woman or a deer he watched stand up on its hind legs. She'd never seen anything quite like that, but the feeling he described, the deep sense of the unnatural, the way her mind and body recoil instinctively from this sight, feels the same. Did you see that? She asks, her throat so tight that her voice comes out in a whisper. Her boyfriend shakes his head. See what? There deer out there? You know, a deer completely wrecked my last car, ran right into me. He was fine, got up and walked off like nothing happened. Me, on the other hand. No, it wasn't a deer. She shakes her head. Never mind, it's silly. But the little break in her voice makes him pause. He turns the wheel, pulling the car over by the side of the road, and parks there. Hey, look at me. What's got you so shaken up? He puts a hand on her shoulder, giving it a comforting squeeze. I just, I thought I saw something. She sighs, feeling absurd as she says it out loud. Well, you probably did. All kinds of animals out here. But it's fine, they're more scared of us than we are of them, he reassures her. She shakes her head, frowning. No, I know that. It wasn't an animal, I think. I couldn't quite see it, but I got this awful feeling. All the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Whatever I got a glimpse of, I can't explain it. I just feel like there was something wrong, like it wasn't supposed to be here. She rests her face in her hands, struggling to find the words. He rubs her back, unsure what else to do, what else to say. They sit like that for a long while, before she finally sits back up. Want to go home? He asks. She nods weakly. I'm sorry. I know you wanted to go driving more. It's a new car. He cuts her off. I want to do what you want to do. Come on, let's go by the diner and get a couple burgers. See if they've got any cherry pie left. Sound good? She nods. Sounds great. The young man is just about to put the car back in drive when there is a sudden fluttering motion, something moving through the headlights beam. This time, they both see it and they can only watch wide-eyed as it settles to a stop directly in front of their car. There, the size of a grown man with a 10-foot wingspan, is something unlike anything they have ever seen before. It's massive, dark gray, its face shielded from view by the limited light, with one notable exception. Boring into them are a pair of glowing red eyes, wide and piercing. Then, with a flap of its wings, as quickly as it appeared, the strange thing is gone again. 
The couple sit in complete silence for a long time before they turn to look at each other. They don't speak, but their expressions both say the same thing. You saw that too, right? Still too shocked to speak, the young man cranks the engine with trembling hands and the two speed off back down the deserted road toward town. They have to get back. They have to call the police and tell them... What? That they saw a monster? A flying man with glowing eyes? Will anyone even believe them? Suddenly, the young woman's voice breaks through the tense quiet in the car. Behind us! She cries out. The man glances in the rearview mirror and sees what he would assume were red headlights if he didn't already recognize them. Sure enough, the massive thing is flying behind their car, following them along the road. The car takes a turn, and so does the creature. The car speeds up, and it flaps its wings to catch up to them. It doesn't do anything else, doesn't try to grab them or break the back windshield, it just follows them, watching with an expression that he could almost call curiosity. Then, after five tense miles, it just disappears again, and they're alone, truly alone. That chill on the back of their necks is gone, and they know that wherever that creature came from, it's gone back there, at least for now. When they make it back to town, they pull into the police station and rush inside. They can hardly get their words out as they try to tell the officer on duty what exactly they saw. He's skeptical, of course. Two scared kids seeing things that aren't there, he assumes. But they insist again and again that they know what they saw. He humors them, listens to their story, and suggests that it was some sort of large wild bird. Animals' eyes reflect light, he reminds them. And everything looks worse at night, especially when someone is already all worked up. Realizing they won't be believed, the couple head home and get ready for bed. But they don't sleep. They can't. All they can think about is that massive figure landing right in front of their car and staring directly at them. Its unbelievable wingspan, its speed, the strange interest it had shown in following them home until it disappeared without a trace. What did it want? Will it ever come back? As they lie in bed, staring up at the ceiling and replaying the events of the night again and again in their minds, they wonder if they'll ever get the answers to those questions. One thing is for certain, though. They'll never forget those eyes as long as they live. Contrary to what the police officer thought about their story, this pair of young lovers were not the only ones to see the strange, winged creature around Point Pleasant. Over the next month, Others reported seeing similar things, and soon, eyewitness accounts were pouring in on a regular basis. A pair of volunteer firemen saw it while on duty, describing a massive bird with bright red eyes. A police officer reported seeing an unusually large bird-like animal with eyes that reflected the glow from his flashlight. A group of gravediggers doing their work looked up from their shovels to see something large, dark, and winged fly through the sky overhead, temporarily blotting out the moon. It soared overhead and landed in a far-off tree. All over town, people reported sightings of the creature, and the story grew and grew. The sheriff tried to calm the townspeople down, positing that it was just a sandhill crane, a large bird with a seven-foot wingspan and reddish coloring around its eyes. But the reports kept coming in, and they only got more bizarre. Some said it could fly over 100 miles per hour. Others said it could appear and disappear at will. A man in Salem, West Virginia blamed the creature for strange patterns appearing on the screen of his television set and for strange noises he heard outside of his home at night. Then came the strange being's most infamous appearance. Eyewitnesses saw it, a massive, shadowy winged figure, on the night of December 15th, flying over the Silver Bridge, a suspension bridge over the Ohio River. Soon after this sighting, the bridge collapsed and 46 people lost their lives. Though a fracture in the suspension chain was the culprit, people whispered around town that this mysterious creature was somehow responsible. If not responsible, then the monster was at least connected. It had to be. How could it be a coincidence? This mysterious apparition grew to be known as the Mothman, or simply Mothman. But to the SCP Foundation, it had a different name, SCP-2901. And according to their findings, there wasn't just one Mothman, but an entire species. SCP-2901 refers to a species of carnivorous scavenger creatures that, thus far, have demonstrated limited intelligence. They stand at an average height of 1.7 meters and generally appear to have an ellipsoidal shape with two large red eyes covered in photophoric tissue. Their bodies are covered in tiny iridescent scales, similar to those found in moths, butterflies, and other insects belonging to the Lepidoptera order. They are not bound by standard rules of space or time and are able to move through both at will. This gives them seemingly impossible abilities such as levitation, flight, teleportation, and the emission of an acoustic cancellation effect 
thought to help them avoid detection. In spite of these talents, they are still impervious to some ordinary forces, such as standard firearms. Due to their unique abilities making them especially elusive, these creatures have proven difficult to contain using conventional methods. Not only that, but it has become increasingly difficult over time to keep the general public from discussing the possibility of their existence. The first appearance of SCP-2901 on record occurred in West Virginia in 1967, shortly before the catastrophic collapse of the Silver Bridge. Since then, SCP-2901 instances have gone out of their way to avoid humans, keeping to themselves as much as possible and vanishing from sight when approached. However, they have continued to manifest near the sites of various disasters, appearing to a handful of eyewitnesses in the location approximately a week to a month before something terrible occurs there. Somehow, through a predictive ability compared by some researchers to a sense of smell, they are able to detect when an event resulting in multiple fatalities will occur. Once they have first appeared in an area, the creatures will remain there and guard it until the disaster comes to pass. They are extremely territorial, fighting with each other for dominance over the area and even changing their shapes to frighten humans that wander into their territory. Once the disaster has occurred, the instances of SCP-2901 in the area will scavenge the dead until there is no more food left for them. Then, they will disappear once and for all, leaving no trace behind. Because SCP-2901 cannot be physically contained, the SCP Foundation has instead put guidelines in place for managing the creature's appearances, as well as what to do if an agent encounters one of these ethereal beings in the field. Cases involving SCP-2901 are assigned to Mobile Task Force 55, also known as the Twilighters. Not to be confused with fans of a certain young adult vampire romance series. Any civilian encounters with SCP-2901 should be addressed with standard amnestic procedures, and any media leaks regarding the creatures such as social media posts, YouTube videos, or local news reports will be deleted or otherwise countered by the Information Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division. Field agents have been instructed to avoid SCP-2901 if possible, and carry mobile devices capable of SMS messaging in the event of one of the creatures using acoustic cancellation. If an operative comes face to face with an instance of SCP-2901 and there is no way to avoid a direct confrontation, there are specific steps that they must follow in order to minimize casualties. First, do not attempt to run away from the creature, lest it be provoked to chase after you. Second, hold your ground and maintain eye contact. Do not show weakness. Third, make a threat display, similar to the display the creatures use to frighten civilians away. Use your clothing to make yourself look bigger, stand on your tiptoes, and spread your arms wide. Continue this step until SCP-2901 either loses interest or is intimidated into standing down. If the creature approaches, do whatever you can to keep from touching it. Throw objects or brandish a makeshift weapon if you must. Though they do not tend to deliberately harm living humans, the fluctuating nature of the creature's position in space and time causes direct physical contact between them and a human to result in a dermal fusion. Essentially, they become stuck together. But the creature does not realize this. When they then attempt to flee and leave the human behind, the results are… painful, to say the least. Imagine the feeling of ripping off a large band-aid. Now multiply that by a thousand, and multiply again. One more time? That's what it feels like. Though these guidelines were put together with Foundation field operatives in mind, they may come in handy for any civilian who accidentally crosses paths with SCP-2901. Should you find yourself in that unfortunate position, I hope that this information will help you avoid unnecessary trauma and pain. One more thing. I initially believed the preceding information to be all the available research into the nature of SCP-2901. However, after obtaining some additional security clearance through methods I won't detail here out of concern for the safety of all involved, I was able to locate this classified entry into its official file. It is a missive from the Information Detraction, Censorship, and Rescission Division, and details a practice of containment known as Operation Surgeon's Photograph, intended to act as a public disinformation campaign regarding the nature of SCP-2901. The purpose of this operation is not to conceal information about SCP-2901 from the public, but rather to control the information they have access to. A summary of the operation's methodology and ongoing success was included, and reads as follows. SCP-2901's current evolution is the sum of Foundation efforts in manipulating its existence through public perception. SCP-2901 are a group of extra-dimensional entities that lack a stable cohesive form and purpose that only coalesces through continued observational reconciliation. 
For SCP-2901 to maintain a stable physical mass, approximately 75% of the nearby human populace within 500 kilometers need to be congruent on a singular concept of what SCP-2901 is and what it does. SCP-2901 were first discovered and categorized as highly unstable Keter-class entities, capable of producing localized CK-class scenarios at random. Further research into SCP-2901's unstable manifestations proved to be futile, as, unbeknownst to Foundation scientists at the time, SCP-2901 would involuntarily change during each subsequent observation. During a containment breach into the civilian populated areas within the Appalachian region of the southern United States, SCP-2901 began gradually condensing into a singular manifestation the more it was exposed to humans. Civilians began conceding to the idea that SCP-2901 was a dark, winged-like humanoid with large red eyes which corresponded to pre-existing local folklore. SCP-2901 also began to evolve predatory-like behaviors and anomalous acoustic effects that conceptualized due to the mass fear generated within the surrounding communities. Foundation researchers recognized the effects and began isolating SCP-2901 as much as possible. However, deprived of regular perceptual input, SCP-2901 began to devolve into its initial highly unstable manifestations once again. The decision was made to maintain SCP-2901 in a functioning, manageable state through continued exposure to human perceptual belief that SCP-2901 is a tangible creature of local folklore, another Bigfoot or Loch Ness monster. The nearby Silver Bridge collapse of 1967 and the SCP-2901 Appalachian incursion, in reality, have no connection with one another. However, public opinion strongly disagreed, and henceforth SCP-2901 began to appear at other future disaster events. This was the precursor of the precognitive scavenging animal-like behavior that is observed today. Efforts are to continue gradually introducing notions developed by the Foundation as to further SCP-2901's evolution into a more docile and manageable concept. I'm not sure I appreciate the implication that Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster don't exist. I, for one, am still holding out hope. But this finding still does compel me. Belief is a powerful thing. It can shape the world around us in unexpected ways, and apparently can even shift the nature of an entire race of creatures that otherwise refuse to abide by our rules and our understanding. Who knows what these beings will look like, how they will behave a few years down the line. For now, they are shadowy, precognitive scavengers, waiting in the wings for humanity to encounter disaster, then picking up the leftovers for themselves. They may not mean us any harm, but the sight of them can and should still strike terror into the heart. If you're ever out on your own and you spot a wide pair of glowing red eyes in the darkness, hear the rustle of leaves, of something floating through the trees like a cloud of black mist, you should probably leave that place immediately. You won't want to be there for what's coming next. Because whether it takes a day or a month, SCP-2901 only goes where it knows it will be fed. Something dark and impossibly huge moves beneath the surface of the water. A woman in a kayak paddles across the surface of a lake, following behind a few other kayakers. She starts to fall behind and paddles faster to keep up. For some reason, she's growing noticeably more and more anxious as she paddles. She keeps glancing down at the water eyes wide, sweat beating on her forehead. We can't see what she sees, but something down there is terrifying her. She paddles faster, 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 and doesn't see the rock up ahead. She hits it, her kayak tipping over, dumping her into the water. She splashes frantically, trying to tip the kayak back over and climb to safety. But just as she's about to grab hold of the edge of the boat, something unseen yanks her down into the water, out of sight. As the other kayakers turn around to see where she went, they see the capsized kayak and bright red blood blooming across the water. The young woman sits back in her chair, pushing her sunglasses up onto her head to get a better look at the book she's leafing through. She takes a long, deep breath, relishing the smell of salt and seaweed, coconut-scented sunscreen, and sun-baked sand. She stretches her legs, feeling the sand between her toes, almost too warm to be comfortable, but not quite. It's a perfect day at the beach, warm but breezy, bustling but not too crowded. It's the best way to kick off summer break after the exhausting grind of exams. She glances up from her book and watches with an amused smile as her best friend trudges his way out into the water, wearing the unwieldy water shoes she always gently mocks him for. 
They slosh with every step, so loud she can almost hear them over the rush of the tide. But he doesn't care about what he looks like. He only cares about what knowledge the sea has to offer. He's an ecology major with plans to become a marine biologist and uncover the mysteries of the deep, so it's a given that he's taking the first opportunity to poke around in the water. As an English literature major herself, the young woman will stick to the dry, sunny beach chair, the book, and an ice-cold lemonade. Even though the two are opposites in many ways, they've always gotten along, ever since they first met during freshman orientation. He teaches her about sharks, she teaches him about postmodernist fiction, and they both broaden their horizons. It works, why question it too much? She got a bit lost in the reminiscence, watching her friend in his natural element, but the heat is starting to get to her, and she could use a little refreshment. She reaches for her drink, taking a sip, and glances back out at the water. Wait, where'd he go? He was right there. But all of a sudden, she can't spot him anymore. She's getting ready to call out his name when she sees a hand break the surface of the water, followed by another hand, both splashing wildly. Her best friend emerges, paddling, gasping for air. Her stomach drops with the sudden realization that something is terribly wrong. He starts to scream, but the sound is swallowed when he's pulled back under the water once more. She calls out for help, signals the lifeguard, but by the time help reaches him, her friend is gone. Not dead, not a body floating on the waves, just vanished. The only thing left of him is a dark bloom of blood, visible even from the shore. All at once, the picture-perfect day at the beach is cut short by tragedy, and the young woman falls to her knees in despair, barely even feeling a thing as the tide rushes in around her. In the days that follow, she can't fathom doing any of her original summer vacation plans, the two of them were supposed to be enjoying the break together, but instead, he's gone, and she doesn't even have a body for the funeral. She can't stop replaying the moment over and over in her mind. One moment, he was absolutely fine, enjoying a swim and looking for different wildlife, and the next, he was drowning, screaming. What could have been responsible for a sudden disappearance like that? At first, she assumed it must have been a shark attack, in spite of all her friends' efforts to persuade her that sharks were nothing to be afraid of. There's no such thing as shark-infested waters, he often repeated. We infest the waters. They just live there. Even so, she couldn't come up with a better explanation than a shark. But when she brought up the idea to the lifeguard on duty, he insisted that it couldn't have been a shark. There hadn't been any spotted in the area, not during the day and that close to shore. Besides, and he put this as delicately as he possibly could, if a shark had gotten a hold of her friend, there would have been some pieces to find. With no body, no answers, and no closure, she spends her days clearing out his room in the campus apartment they shared. Going through his things, sorting out what to send back to his family, what to donate, what to keep. It helps her feel close to him, even though he's gone. And if she's being completely honest with herself, part of her is still clinging to the hope that she might find some sort of explanation here. She boxes up the remainders of his books and is just about to leave for the day when she spots one that she missed. It doesn't look like any of his textbooks or the nonfiction he was so fond of reading in his free time. It's an old, worn, leather-bound volume, tucked under the bed like a secret. She sets the box down and reaches under the bed for the book. Its spine is unmarked, no title to be found. Her curiosity peaked now more than ever. She cracks it open. The room fills with the scent of mildew and dust. The book smells as old as it looks. The title page has been ripped out, but as she begins to peruse its contents, she sees descriptions of ancient sea monsters, of unfathomable horrors of the deepest ocean. It's a book about aquatic folklore. Why didn't he tell her he was reading this? They could have bonded over folktales, over him enjoying something fictional for once. She considers tossing the book in the box with the rest, but instead, she slips it into her bag feeling closer to her lost friend than she has since some unknown force took him from her. That night, as she's preparing for bed in her own room, trying not to think about the uncanny silence of the newly vacant room across the hall, she cracks open the old book again. She thumbs through the pages, skimming the accounts of leviathans and krakens, taking in the intricate illustrations of sea-dwelling beasts. She turns the page and freezes, eyes locked on the illustration there. Something is different about this one, though she can't put it into words. Its face, its enormous, monstrous shape, it makes her feel cold, sweaty, 
and seasick. Her hands tremble, scarcely able to maintain their grip on the book. None of the other creatures illustrated here have made her feel like this, like she's truly locking eyes with a deadly predator. She slams the book shut, and the feeling of dread ebbs away. It's just a book. It's just a drawing. It can't do anything to her. Besides, it isn't as if it's real. That night, she tosses and turns, her mind tormented by visions of deep, dark water crushing her with its pressure, of gasping for breath and swimming for a surface she can't quite reach. All the while, she feels something swimming just below, rising up from the ocean floor. In her dream, she wants to turn and look, but she can't bring herself to do it. She knows what she'll see, opening its mouth to swallow her whole. When she wakes the next morning, her heart is still racing, and her sheets are soaked with sweat. She takes a moment to remind herself that it was only a dream, that she's safe and sound in her bedroom on dry land. She peels herself out of bed and walks down the hall to the bathroom to take a shower. But when she turns the knob and water begins to gush from the shower head, her stomach turns. The idea of getting into the shower starts her heart pounding again, adrenaline coursing through her veins and begging her to flee. She turns the shower off, and the anxiety abates. No shower today, then. That's fine. It's just a bit of the previous night's dreams lingering. As the day goes on, it'll pass, and she'll feel like herself again. But all day, the feeling persists. She walks by the public pool and shudders at the sight of children playing in the water. She crosses the street to avoid a sprinkler spraying someone's lawn. She jumps over a puddle with the intensity of someone avoiding stepping on a landmine. She's never felt like this before. Grief can take a lot of unusual shapes. Could this be another one of them? She ducks into a nearby coffee shop and settles at a table with her laptop. Her fingers hover over the keyboard and she wills herself to look up coping mechanisms for grief and unusual anxiety. But her instincts kick in, and she types something else entirely. Unexplained disappearances in water. She scrolls through stories about tragic drownings, cars sinking into swamps, and murder victims dumped in lakes. Then, a headline catches her eye. Local man vanished in swimming pool, family say. She clicks the link and finds a story that feels eerily familiar. A family was enjoying a day at the pool when one of the children pushed his father into the pool as a joke. He seemed to panic upon entering the water, thrashing violently before disappearing entirely. Though the water was clear, they couldn't see him anymore. He never resurfaced. A wave of nausea washes over her as she realizes that this has happened before. How many times? She continues her search, reading about similar disappearances in lakes, hot tubs, and even one man who vanished in a charity dunk tank. Several of the reports described the missing persons as developing an unusual fear of water prior to their disappearances. Sometimes there is blood left behind, sometimes there is no trace at all. But with every story, the result is the same. Someone is inexplicably pulled under the water, and they are never seen again. But why? She searches for a common thread between the stories, something that could link them together. Is it possible it's all just random? But then she spots something, a throwaway line in the first article. The missing man was a cryptid enthusiast, particularly obsessed with the Loch Ness Monster and other aquatic creatures. Another was a writer, researching for a monster movie set on a fishing boat. Another was the president of her high school folklore club. It hits her like a bolt of lightning. Of course, all these people were led to their horrible fates through the research they were doing. And when did she begin feeling this state of dread? When she'd looked into that terrible, nightmarish book she'd found at her friend's home. The same book that's now sitting in a drawer in her desk. Her thoughts race with all the horrible possibilities. Could it be some form of psychosis she's dealing with? Or something even more terrifying? An honest-to-God curse of some kind? A supernatural affliction that put her in the crosshairs of some terrible underwater beast? She grabs the book out of her desk, wondering if maybe taking another look at the thing that started all this could dispel her fear. There had to be some kind of rational explanation, but she can't bring herself to turn the page. Just the thought of looking at that monster again makes her head feel light and causes her skin to break out in a cold sweat. Suddenly, she feels parched. If she doesn't get some cold water to drink, she might pass out. With no time to waste, she runs for her ensuite bathroom, grabbing a clean glass from one of her cabinets and filling it with nice, cold water. But as she lifts the glass up to her mouth, she feels another injection of that impossible, icy dread. Is that something 
moving in the bottom of the glass? Almost involuntarily, her grip loosens and the glass of water falls to the floor, shattering. She screams and vaults away, not startled by the flying pieces of shattered glass, but genuinely terrified by the puddle that's now on the floor. She feels an inescapable sense that death is lurking in a small puddle rapidly sinking into her dorm room carpet. That moment clinches it. She needs to find some way to solve this, or she'll inevitably go down one of two paths. On the first path, she'd turn into a reclusive, paranoid wreck, forever fearing the dark fate that may or may not come. On the second, she'd be just like her friend, a red smear on the surface of some unknown body of water. Her research rabbit hole becomes an all-consuming obsession. She stops going to classes altogether, building a spider wall of newspaper clippings and printed off articles on her wall. There are so many disappearances and inexplicable events around water she believes may be related to this aquatic horror. It takes weeks of research to find something she can actually use. Another survivor, one just like her, who'd encountered the creature and used his smarts to survive. After a few emails and calls, proving that she wasn't just some tourist fascinated by madness, the other survivor agrees to meeting at his house in Nebraska, the only triple landlocked state in the US. She drives several hours to reach the home of the other survivor. When he meets her at the door, she's a little taken aback by his appearance. He's a young man, but he's got the chapped, weathered skin of someone much older. His hair is burnt and stringy, his lips glistening with dead skin. He's clearly cultivated a kind of dryness that most humans would consider unhealthy. When she enters the survivor's home, she's immediately greeted by the hum of multiple dehumidifiers going off at once, giving the air a stifling, desert-like feel. Every inch of the floor is covered in newspapers, ready to soak up any moisture that might fall. Seeing all the procedures that the survivor needs to go through just to avoid the aquatic horror fills her with a different kind of horror. Is she looking at her future right now? Is it worth surviving this thing if this squalor and paranoia is what survival looks like? The survivor explains his long and sordid tale. He'd once been a deep-sea fisherman when one fateful night changed his life forever. While they were trawling the vast and distant oceans, they'd picked up a man flailing in the water who told them an impossible story. Just moments ago, he'd been in his bathtub when something dragged him underneath. When the survivor and the rest of the crew asked him what had done this to him, he described a terrible and immense beast underneath the waves, and just the description was enough. In the following weeks, one by one, the other members of the crew disappeared, all during circumstances dealing with water. The survivor developed a crippling fear of all things water and has since moved to Nebraska to get further away from his fear. As far as he's aware, there's no cure, just a way to eke out your existence and minimize risk. But of course, even if your risk of encountering water is low, it's never zero, as these two unfortunate people are about to find out. There's a thunder crack above the house, a genuine bolt from the blue, as huge, ominous storm clouds roll in. Then comes the rain, the worst rainfall that Nebraska has seen in decades. Hammering down on the roof of the survivor's house while he and the young woman wait inside, the roof would only hold it back for so long, and as another great doctor once said, water always wins. The young woman and the survivor begin to panic, but panic will do them no good. The house has sprung a leak. Water is dripping from the ceiling and slithering down the walls, disintegrating the newsprint and forming deep, dark puddles on the floor. The duo tries to escape, but the second they accidentally step into a patch of wet, they're pulled down into the dark, gasping, flapping, and struggling for breath. They're not in Nebraska anymore. They're floating in the middle of a vast and impossible ocean with no land in sight. Below them, in the murky waters, something impossibly huge moves. It's futile to escape. In her quest to understand what happened to her friend, she's about to gain a better understanding than she ever would have wanted, as the beast rises from the depths and closes its jaws around them both. SCP-1128 is an enormous aquatic predator that only manifests to those who are aware of what it looks like. Anyone given a full description of the entity's appearance or who has seen an illustration or image of the entity will become infected by it. Once infected, a person behaves relatively normally, aside from an increased aversion to any activity that requires being submerged in water, such as swimming. 
If an infected person is fully submerged in water, they will disappear beneath its surface. It does not matter whether or not the water is actually deep enough for someone to be pulled beneath the surface. In fact, during one experiment, a D-Class was pulled into a glass of water by the entity, at which point he disappeared from sight. After the subject has disappeared, one of two things tends to happen next. Either they reappear in a state of panic, trying to leave the water before the entity can grab hold of them again, or the water will begin to fill with blood and other organic matter belonging to the subject. Subjects that reappeared and managed to escape the water before being attacked again had described the experience of being transported to the middle of a vast ocean, where SCP-1128 attempts to devour them. Though these interviews provide vital information on the nature of SCP-1128's methods of hunting, they must be conducted with extreme care as they carry an inherent risk of SCP-1128 infection if the subject is a bit too descriptive in their account. Thankfully, any accidental exposure to a description of SCP-1128 can be treated with the application of amnestics. Any written descriptions or images of SCP-1128's appearance or videos of the entity breaching the surface of the water found outside of the Foundation's custody must be destroyed, and anyone exposed to this information or showing signs of contamination is to be given Class C amnestics. A written description of SCP-1128 is to be kept at an assigned Foundation site for experimental purposes and experimental purposes only. It may not be read by anyone other than D-Class selected for testing with the entity. If any staff are exposed, they must immediately report for administration of Class C amnestics. Any and all water traffic that passes through the area thought to be SCP-1128's usual habitat is to be intercepted by Mobile Containment Force Kappa-12, Sea Devils. They are authorized to do so by any means necessary. It's been said that we know more about outer space, the vast, endless expanse of stars and planets, than we do about the depths of our oceans. So I suppose the existence of an entity like SCP-1128 shouldn't come as too much of a surprise, amidst giant squids and nitrogen-breathing microbes. Still, one of the most comforting things about the horrors of the deep has always been, in my opinion, the certainty that we are safe from them on land. SCP-1128 is proof that, as soothing as that notion may be, it is entirely false. Danger doesn't just lurk beneath the dark, rolling surface of the ocean. It can find you in a swimming pool, a bathtub, a single glass of water. Ordinarily, I like to pursue as much independent research as I can into the topics that I cover, always in pursuit of more answers, of a broader understanding. In this particular case, however, I believe it's best to let sleeping aquatic horrors lie. SCP-1128 can remain a mystery to me. Whether it's fish, mammal, or something else we've yet to categorize, I'm happy to leave it alone, rather than wind up as its next piece of bait. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-427, Lovecraftian Locket, 